Hey, Gordon, how's your arm? Oh, it's okay. Um, I have to go. I was at the, the hospital center today and the x-ray wasn't definitive. Uh, so I have to go and get a CT scan. You're muted. I guess, oh yeah, I guess it's better than it having been definitively bad, right? Yeah, yeah. But the way the guy talked, it sounded like if he does surgery, it'll be fixed quicker. <laughs> I mean, oh, I like knows? that. I like that. Like the like attitude of like, yes, we can fix this. You know? Yeah. Hey, Aaron. Hi. How are you? Fine. How are you? Another damn paradise. Yes, we can, Tiffany. How are you? Okay. Sorry, I've been having weird issues going on with my um, lab. With her laptop. <laughs> or maybe it's her lap. You never know. You never know. How's it going, Allison? Good, and you? Good, good. Hey, did Brenda. your hair pull back, or did you get like a crazy haircut? No, I pulled it back. All right. Good evening, everyone. Hey Brenda. Hi Brenda. You might want to tilt your camera down a little so we can see you. I'm so short that won't even work either. <laughs> oh. Brenda, you I, need a booster seat. And you know, I have tried the booster seat too. <laughs> oh. I would try. Almost there. So close. <laughs> We see your eyes. That's helpful. <laughs> That's something. It's something. I, okay, guys, I, I'm I'm gonna turn my camera off while I finish my dinner real quick. Yeah, and I I I'm putting my camera on mute because my daughter's having some health issues, so I I'm doing double duty. Um, but I am here. Did we hear from anyone who might not be at the meeting? Any commissioners? I haven't heard anything. Uh -uh. I spoke to Perry and LaRoya today, and they both said they'd see me at the meeting, so. All right. I also heard from DDOT for my um, presentation, and they are coming. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hello, happy election week leading into. Hey. Gordon, you never emailed me back. Do you do you need anything? I'm good right now. I have to it's just get getting tests, but I'll let you know. Okay, let me know if you need anything, okay, hon? Thank you. Hi, Scott. Okay, Scott, what's the look that you're going for here? Happy Halloween. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, I like it. Leroy is calling me now. Hold on, guys. I was just being silly. Does anybody even remember the Matrix? Yes. <laughs> it was a long time ago. It's my favorite movie. <laughs> really? Scott, I really love the whole like Matrix thing that you have going on behind you. Thank you. Did you see the glasses too? I had the glasses to go with it. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. So we're doing like full blown Halloween? Uh oh, I see. Did I do How wrong? did I miss this memo? Those glasses are so 1999 too. It's <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> so it's seven. We're missing Laroya and Perry. Oh, Perry's. We have a qualm. Um, yeah, it looks Good crazy. Good evening, everyone. 
Good evening. How is everyone? It's beautiful, cool Monday afternoon. And I want to thank everyone uh, for participating on last month that I was not able to attend. And I'm hoping and praying that everyone is staying safe as possible and wearing your mask as we are uh, asked to do because the pandemic is on the rise again. And uh, we need to just completely stay safe. Parents, think about your kids going back to school, you know, uh, a lot of things that, you know, we need, that they need to be taught before they go back. I have not had time to listen to the news today about the schools. But anyway, we're going to get started. It is at the 701. Um, we have been doing virtual meetings for quite a while now. So I'm not going to go over the concerns, but uh, we're asking everyone to keep your phone muted um, until you are called upon. We are asking everyone, you know, you know the rules to raise your hand if you have a question or you need to speak. And from that note, we're going to ask um, Aaron to call the roll. Okay, <clears throat> 4B01. Present. 4B02, present. 4B03. Present. 4B04. Present. 4B05. Present. 4B06. Present. 4B07. Present. 4B08. Present. 4B09. In process. She's joining. Okay. So we have a quorum with. Okay. Thank you. En route into the meeting. We have a quorum. Everyone had a chance to uh, go over the agenda for tonight. Do we have any changes? No changes? Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, uh, me, can, can I finish? <laughs> can I finish for a minute, please, ma'am? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. I, I love you guys. I, I love you. Y'all keep me laughing, and that's a good thing. But anyway, uh, thank you all for not changing the agenda for tonight. So now, can I get it approved? I make a motion to approve. <laughs> I'll second it. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Administrative items number one. Consideration. Brenda, can we vote on the agenda really quick? Oh, I thought we just did. I'm going ahead. Huh? Yeah. We have the motion in the second. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Nays. All right, thank you. Eyes have it. Okay, administrative items. Correct, Aaron. Aaron? Yes. All and right, we just thank you. Thank you. Did the you. agenda, so we're on to the next thing. Okay. All right. Number one is consideration approval October agenda. Everyone read over the October agenda. Yes, ma'am. Can we get a motion? We just did that. Didn't we just do this? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing you had on. And you know yeah. what? I'm thinking September. I'm sorry. You know what? I'm sorry, y'all. I'm thinking no, September. that's okay. I think I think one was for the the uh, October minutes, and then the other is for. No, that's okay. We got us. Yeah, I see it, sweetie. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. All right. Now going on to number three because I discussed the virtual meeting and you know all that. Okay, approve of the September regular meeting. The minutes. Minutes meetings. Yes. Okay. I, <laughs> I move to approve the September minutes for the meeting. I second. It's been approved and second. Second. All of those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Nays. Have any nays? All right. Nays have it. Thank you. Next number four is the treasury report and the financial report for the uh, fourth quarter. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I, we had the um, quarterly financial report on here for the fourth quarter of 2020. I'm actually not going to move uh, to approve that tonight. Um, I didn't end up circulating those materials to all of you um, because I'm waiting for a revision to the spreadsheet we use from the office of the ANC. 
So um, we will get those to you and have it next month. So the only treasurer's report I have is um, status on our bank account. Uh, as of our um, end of September bank statement, we have uh, $23,966.88. So real, uh, basically unchanged from the last few months minus bank fees and interest. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner's update. Aaron? Yes, I just had a few things to raise. I took some notes so that I could be quick on this. Um, I wanted to provide a voting update since early voting starts in DC tomorrow. Um, if folks are planning to vote in person, you can vote anytime between tomorrow and election day on November 3rd. I'll put the link to vote center locations in the chat. Um, that page will also have updates regarding approximate wait times once voting starts. You can vote at any vote center. It's not tied to your precinct. Um, and the Board of Elections has advised for people to vote early and bring a mask. And then if folks are still, still have their mail-in ballots, you should return that ASAP if you're voting by mail. And you can do that by Postal Service, Secure Dropbox, or any open vote center. And I'll also drop the link to the Secure Ballot Dropbox locations and the mail-in ballot tracker. Um, that's all I have. <coughs> Anyone else? No one else? Okay, thank you, Erin. Thank you. Okay, number three presentation by what is Tess Fallon, AIM, and Yvonne Farewell, Department of Transportation. Talking Hold about the rehabilitation of Eastern Avenue. Hold on one second, guys. I'm promoting you now. And Gordon, oh, okay, you got Syrah. Okay, that's a, I was just gonna say that, thank you. Good evening all. Um, my name is Syrah Molina. I'm here from the Department of Transportation. Um, Mr. Aim is going to start presenting on um, the Eastern Act project, and I'll let him take it from here, and he can introduce himself. Good morning. I'm Tesfal Aim. I'm the new project manager for Eastern Avenue Northeast Rehabilitation. I'm very glad to be part of the project. This is a very exciting project when it is executed through really make a, it will make a difference in the road conditions and uh, the safety of the road, the efficiency of intersection and the corridor appearance will have really significant change. Uh, let me start by uh, mentioning the limit of the project. The project st starts from New Hampshire Avenue Northeast and ends in Whittier Street Northwest. It is about 0 0.6 mile, around 3,150 linear feet. Uh, let me briefly describe the corridor characteristics and then the objectives of the improvement and the design changes incorporated in the course of the design phase and its impact on the schedule of the project and finally the current uh, status of the project. So as you're familiar with the condition, uh, the road uh, on the road classification the road has inadequate lane transition from four lane to two lane. Uh, it has significant crash and sag vertical curves. It is a hilly area and it has deteriorating pavement and curves. When it comes to traffic operation, there's a steep gradient, there's queen, there's no left turn. When it comes to pedestrian and bicycle facilities, there's unsafe, unsignalized pedestrian crossing and limited side distance. There's no sidewalks or pedestrian access to bus stop. Uh, the, there are non-ADA uh, ramps. Uh, when it comes to traffic control, there are deteriorated signs, sign clutter, improper sign placement. There's, there are pull lane markings, inadequate intersection lighting, 
And when it comes to drainage, the current drainage uh, storm system is inadequate or under capacity to carry the current runoff water. And when it comes to landscaping, the unhealthy trees, there's improper pruning. Uh, as you're familiar with the current uh, road conditions. So as you can see, this is a retained wall, the crack, the bus stop has no sidewalk, uh, ADA compliant and sidewalk. The ramps are not ADA uh, compliant. So did that uh, embark this project to make improvement on this uh, road conditions and initiated with the following road uh, improvement objectives to increase the multimodal safety and accessibility to improve pedestrian movement, to improve the corridor's appearance and functionality with new pavement and granite curves and provide a safe roadway for bicyclists, bicyclists by adding a new lane in each direction, uh, provide a safe roadway, yeah. uh, reconstruct 988 com compliant features and reconstruct the deteriorating roadway uh, infrastructure. But in the course of the design phase, there was a lot of uh, changes and uh, discussions was uh, including two public meeting and a lot of uh, discussion with utility companies like DC Water, Pepco, Washington Gas, and there was a lot of uh, uh, change orders through the uh, the phase of the design phase of the project. And I'd like to mention the main ones which uh, added change of scope to the project. Uh, there was road improvements added, and those are uh, intention to provide new traffic signal and modify existing ones. Reconstruct the full roadway depths for the entire project stretch. Previously, there was areas where there was milling and resurfacing, but current scope is to uh, tear down the whole stretch and build the base and then resurface it. There's a new street lights uh, design for the whole stretch of the project. There's installation for underground decks for street lights, traffic, and communication cables. Uh, we are also upgrading the existing drainage system. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the current uh, drainage system is uh, under capacity and due to uh, comments from DC water, almost 85% of the drain system, DC water drain system is being upgraded, which is uh, required to have additional 30 test pits uh, to comply with the comments and also there were comments from mushroom gas. So those are the, the main uh, major uh, scope changes to the road improvement. Uh, those two lane uh, uh, northbound lanes, which we changed eliminating one and introduced uh, one bike lane in every direction. This is one of the initial scope of work. Just to give you an overview on the overall uh, project scope, we start from uh, New Hampshire uh, Avenue. There's a significant modification on the traffic signal and street lights in the intersection and also upgrading the ramps to ADA standard. As I mentioned, there's the whole the street will be reconstructed when it comes to the pavement. Previously, it was eight inch base and two inch uh, uh, asphalt. Now we are turning down according to the new design. We have a new uh, traffic signal at Sligo Mill Road. We are modifying the existing traffic signal at Kansas Avenue intersection. And we are uh, almost uh, uh, coming to completion on this part. From the initial phase, we have uh, uh, a new six foot sidewalk with six foot uh, grass buffer, northbound from Sligo Road to North Capital. So those are the main features of the projects. Some are from uh, the initial scope of work, some are added in the, during the course of the design phase. 
Now, this major scope item uh, resulted in delay and significant delay to mention some uh, of the issues rated uh, or some of the issues that attribute to the change, uh, the street light division policy of uh, underground installation. They have changed the policy to underground all cable and uh, we have to incorporate this underground uh, conduit for the traffic signal, the communication and street light uh, uh, cables and also the traffic our traffic division has decided to introduce the traffic signal as three mirror uh, so this is also became part of the project and the modification of traffic signal which i mentioned earlier plus the design of storm drainage has significantly affected the, the schedule of the project and delayed it. and uh it was necessary to extend the project schedule further. Besides that, this scope of additional scope of work has contributed negatively to the revision of other plan, which has been completed by the time this uh, additional scope has in, been incorporated in the design phase, uh, making further delay. For example, to incorporate the intersection reconfiguration and avoid the utility conflict with the new lighting poles, we were required to revise the roadway plan and designs, which were already at 90% some meter. Uh, the same with the sign in and pavement marking and MOT design, it was at 90% design. Uh, drainage design, it was initially 90%, but with the comments at 90%, from DC water, we have to go back and revise all the plan, which has been 90%. So this has resulted in extension of the schedule further. So the change orders came one after another and uh, it was from that perspective that necessary to incorporate them as uh, we will not be able to make any changes on the coming five years in the project, it was better to introduce all the necessary features that are needed from different perspectives. But finally, we are now close to completion, uh, October 30, by a week from now, the consultant will submit uh, the 95% completion and by January next year, we will be 100% complete. So after all this uh, change orders, delays uh, and extensions, finally we came to the final phase of the uh, design of the project. And as to the funding of construction, we are uh, waiting for the allocation of the fund. Uh, this is what I have to update you on the current status, and I think I have 10 minutes more. If you have uh, any questions, I'll be happy to elaborate further. Uh, I'm new to the project, so but I have grasped a lot of um, the history of the project, and uh, I'll do my best to answer if you have questions from the previous uh, year or I handed over this project in this uh, year in June. Thank you for your attention. Please, uh, if you have any question, I'm available to answer. Yes, madam. Yes. Yes, I'm Perry Ray, 4B05. I have a question for you. Uh, this particular phase of the project, which which part of the project is this? Is this closer to the beginning of the entire uh, the entire uh, renovation project? I can't hear you. To the end. Where exactly? All right. Thank you. Can you rephrase what he said? Uh, the, his voice was cutting. Oh, I'm sorry. Are, are you asking uh, about the, the, the schedule of where we are in the design in the design process? 
if you're asking about the how we are in the design process, the design is almost completed. We'll be finishing that up in the next few months. Thank you. Does that help? Okay. Yes. Um, can I can I jump in next then? That's all right. Um, I I would like to. Uh, so you say the construction start and completion is TBD. I mean we've been we decided. I mean the design will be complete January next year, but we are waiting for the fund for the construction. So the schedule as fund fund independent. So so at what? How soon should we have an answer on that? Well, uh, now on the budget allocation, I can't give an answer on that. That's a senior management uh, issue, but I am following and uh, I have requested fund for the project. And so far we don't have uh, any allocation. Okay, and once it starts, how long would it take for a process like this? I, I can tell you just recently, um found out we we put it in for funding for FY22 for the construction and we didn't this project did not get that um and we can't tell you beyond that and I saw a question pop up earlier as to whether it's gonna be federal or local funding they've recently changed the way they do it and we submit the needs and the upper management um allocates funding for uh federal versus local so it's a little bit different uh, going forward. So if we this is this is Tiffany Johnson. So I'm I'm just trying to get clarification. You're you do not have funding for this project for the construction right. of it, correct? For the construction, what funding do you have? We we have we had the funding to complete the design and for the design only. Correct. Yeah, so all pro all major projects go through um, the process of first being design, which we are current, the team that's here is the design team. Once after the design is completed, um, it moves on to procurement and construction. Um, and so we're not at that stage no more at, right now because um, right now we're on like they're fit finalizing the design. There was a delay on the designs due to added um, work. <coughs> and excuse me. And so that is the update that the engineers providing today. Okay, who, so we. Whose voice is that responding? Is that Miss Thelwell? Who who's, who is that who just responded? Cyra, oh, that, that was Sarah from All right, thank you. Molina. But All right, thank I'm, you. I'm asking, we are not ready to break ground. No, not right now. Right now, we're just providing a quick update on the project, on the design um, phase, um, and what uh, consisted of the delay. Because I know um, it's been a while since we've been to the community, and I've I've engaged with the commissioner. Um, and so we wanted to come here and provide a few details about those uh, changes and those addition, additional work to the design. The design is still being, is in process of being completed. Do we have a firm date for when that will be completed? Yes, the engineer went over that on the PowerPoint. Um, Mr. Aim, can you go to the construction? Yeah. This yeah, October thirty. Um, commissioners, you have about one more minute before we turn it to the um, constituents. Okay, they Brenda, they answered my question. January twenty twenty one. Okay. Anyone else, commissioners? I guess if I could just follow up and yes. finish off my previous. Yes. Go ahead. I just I just want to know what's the earliest this could conceivably start. Construction. Well, that depends on the funding. Once we have the funding, we will uh, have the bidding, which will take three, six to nine months, and then the construction will start. We estimate two years, but uh, in the all depends. Procurement, right? right? And in the procurement, we, we have to figure out who's going to do the work, correct? Correct. All right. Uh -huh. all right. And so this is probably a year, 18 months off, correct? Would, would that be a good estimate? 
what well, it all depends on the funding uh, availability. No, we do we do not have funding yet. Um, and the we found out we did not get the funding even for FY22 yet. So the earliest would be FY23. Unless money Thank becomes you. available, we're going to have it what they consider shovel ready. So we're going to have everything ready to go. If funding does come, you know, there might sometimes some shifting of projects, some money might be found and it could start earlier. So I don't want to promise that, but um, in all likelihood it'll be after FY22. Thank you. Okay. And if there are additional you. questions, I know we're out of time. Okay. Um, I, we have three questions here. Uh, one is uh, the road surface is currently in poor condition. Will it be resurfaced pending construction of this project? Second question was, uh, wasn't this the same area just torn up and repaved? Third question, how about some speed bumps? Department of Transportation? Yeah, so uh, I'll answer question two. Um, the road was just uh, torn up and um, repaved, but that was not DDOT work. That was a PEPCO um, conducting um, and um, installing some um, of their utilities underground. Um, and so all of that work that you currently just saw and went through, that was all PEPCO. Um, they've had a couple of meetings in regards to it because I, I believe they're still working on Eastern Ave. Um, in regards to speed humps on Eastern Ave, um, Eastern Ave is uh, what we classified or federal um, guidelines classified as a um, arterial road, I believe. Um, and so for those main arterial roads, um, they unfor we unfortunately are, are not able to provide or install um, speed humps, but we can look at other um, traffic safety common measures that you um, currently have to see what can be implemented, such as signs or better markings, um, such as um, if you want to start the process on that, I'm happy to provide you the uh, website on um, and more information on, on that process. Brenda? Yes. There were some more questions in the chat if you want me to read them. Uh, yes, please, because I didn't see, I didn't look at yeah. the chat. So that's fine. Where is the new traffic signal that was mentioned going? Is this plan being reviewed by DDOT Division Zero team? And is the grass buffer only northbound or also southbound? Uh, and then also, uh, are there 5G towers or lines incorporated in the construction? Okay. As the traffic signal, there's already existing traffic signal, New Hampshire intersection with uh, Eastern Avenue. We are just modifying that uh, intersection, but we are placing a new traffic signal at Silicon Mill Road intersection. And we are modifying to the Kansas Avenue intersection. And of course, this is uh, revised by DDOT uh, traffic signal division, and they forward to whoever is, uh, uh, related uh, uh, design revision that they have their own uh, system where they should also any related uh, agency that has to re devise. We will forward the signal to the signal division and we receive the comments uh, and forward. we coordinate with the uh, consultants on all other designs. But when it comes to traffic, uh, we forward it to our traffic division and they forward to the related agency. And regarding the 5G, we put in the, the duct work for that, the conduits, and the actual communication cables themselves were put in by the, by the companies. So I would imagine if this is several years out, by the time this is ready for construction, I would imagine if it's Verizon or wherever it is, they would put in 5G, but that's not, that's out of our realm. We would, we just supply the conduits and the work for the conduits. They actually put the actual cables in. Uh, one more question, a couple more questions from the chat. Um, please supply more information on what traffic calming is already in the project and will there be a left-hand turn lane at North Capitol or Kansas? Yes, there's uh, a left turn on Kansas Avenue. Uh, there's a, and the, in, the, in the design course, there was first to, to provide only one lane and extend the curve. 
but later in order to provide a left turn, the extension was removed and there are two lanes, one lane will be left turn. And the second question was in- was What that? traffic calming exists? And I, maybe I missed it. Did we get an answer on the grass buffers mm. on both yeah, sides I or just one side? Yeah, on the, on the northbound uh, side is the grass buffer uh, with the sidewalk, with the new sidewalk. So as she mentioned, there's no speed humps on the road, uh, but we have three inter signalized intersections uh, on the road within 0.6 uh, mile stretch. Is that all? Mm. We have people with their hands raised as well. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, Brenda, just two people. Yes, go, go ahead. Be, before we go into our further details, I want I do want to say that um, we will be um, planning to engage with the community um, within the upcoming months um, to better provide design details um, for the final design. Um, so we are planning on hosting our meeting to provide those details um, when um, the when the um, we're ready to provide those designs. Um, we're finalizing them, but we just want to go through uh, a couple of details. But we'll be in contact with the ANC commissioner um, and um, and community leaders uh, to provide a um, meeting update. I'm sorry, that was my daughter in the background. Uh, Lori, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Can I do it? Yeah. Am I there? Yes. Okay, so going from, just a quick question from Kansas. Kansas northbound to North Capitol Street, is that one lane or two lanes going up? One lane and one lane uh, bike lane. So there's, okay. and, then, and then a left turn lane at North Capitol? Mm, in North Capital, no. North Capital will have. Will, will, uh, there's no any intersection signal in North Capital, so it will remain as what it is. One on lane. That side. One mm -hmm. lane. Mm -hmm. And uh, will there be the traffic calming? Will they have the bump outs at the at the intersections of Kansas and North Capital Street the way it was proposed ten years ago? Well, currently, in order to provide the left turn. The proposal was eliminated. The proposal was eliminated. So no traffic calming. So how about some speed bumps? Or I'll start throwing some stuff in the middle of the street. This is ridiculous. Well, there's a traffic signal on that area, which is modified. The intersection will be modified. And there was a lot of discussion about this issue back and forth. And finally, it was decided uh, to provide a left turn and remove that ex uh, pump out. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Griffin, you should be able to talk. You had your hand raised. Going once. I believe it's Mrs. Griffin and she might need help. She might need to know how to get off of mute or what have you. Mrs. Griffin? If, if you're, uh, you should be able to, to press your microphone button in. It's muted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, it look, I think that her question was about 5G and that, so that was answered. Um, and then uh, I guess uh, we have one more uh, from Cheryl Newman. Go ahead. Cheryl's also muted. Okay, unmuted. It's actually Dolly Turner. <laughs> okay, hello, Dolly. And Ms. Griffin is off of mute now. Cheryl Newman. <laughs> um, Syra, um, I'm, and I'm sorry, I didn't hear the engineer's name. Um, given the fact right. that, that, that there's been a challenge with safety, traffic safety for a long time, and this was something mm -hmm. that the residents were anticipating, you know, um, I understand your. Um, uh, I guess the reasons why they can't do speed humps. 
Um, you know, the traffic safety process, if you go online, is 180 days. And so I think what's going to happen, and I just want to kind of, you know, refresh everybody's memory about this, is that there's a lot of construction going on in the area. And the, the amount of construction is going to increase uh, pretty significantly over the next 18 months, which is going to put more pressure on Eastern. It's the construction that's happening near rigs. It's the, um, you know, construction that's going to happen in Tacoma. And so this is all a very, all, all of these areas are interrelated. So um, when you mention the traffic safety piece, you know, Syra, are you talking about the normal 180 day plan or are you able to help work with the community to get to get some attention on this earlier, like rumble, you know, the rumble strips or something like that? Because my guess is that, um, and this is the second part of the question is, is so, Nick, the, wait, I don't what, know if your dad told you, but I'll be working the polls the next three days. Okay. So I won't be getting home till like seven. Oh, you so you and him are on your own. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. The second part of the question is, uh, Syra and uh, the engineer, uh, would the traffic safety piece be part of construction? Because that means that would be 2023. So um, just kind of curious about what your thoughts are about that. To answer the traffic uh, during safety during construction, the construction will be in four phases and there will be traffic uh, MOT prepared, uh, providing uh, detour alternatives and all uh, uh, the plan also will is, is, is being revised again to reflect the current uh, uh, phases or current uh, uh, status of the project. So definitely, yes. There's MOT that will be prepared and the, the contractor has to follow the construction procedures and safety uh, precautions that are indicated in the plan. Mm -hmm. So well, I guess my thought is kind of, golly. what are we going to do in the short, what, what's the, what, what can happen in the short term? We have about one, about 30 more, about six seconds left. I didn't get asked the, uh, the question in short, the, you mean short term? Yeah, yeah, the question was short term, traffic, calming, safety, anything that can happen, uh, you know, between now and two years from now. Uh, I'm here to speak about the project uh, design pro, uh, phase. So I have uh, no knowledge of uh, any current uh, ongoing project uh, Calm in a temporary base. Initially, the project was planned to immediately uh, embark in construction, but only the, the funding is now that keeping it behind. So def, uh, there was no plan to uh, stretch or have uh, a temporary uh, uh, phase uh, to calm uh, the traffic or as a safety precaution because it was planned immediately to go to construction. and. As far as to uh, what I know, there's no any uh, safety. Uh, I don't think even uh, it can be planned because what is was planned it was immediately to go to construction. I, Gordon, did we did we send Dolly back down? Because I think that's a logical follow up question for her since she's on the office from the yeah. council member's office. Let me let I, me we, find her. Maybe again. she can answer about whether or not the council member put forward funding for this in the budget. No, and what happened to that in that process and why it didn't happen if it was ready to go? Um, I think, Evan, that you're, um, um, I think we're happy to look into that. It sounds like there are construction delays and the way that DDOT funding works is on a fiscal year basis. And because there were delays, they don't fund things that can't necessarily happen. Um, so that that's the answer to funding. The second piece is I want to try to make some recommendations that are going to be helpful to you all going forward. As you know, we're going to be transitioning soon. My recommendations are that Commissioner Parks and Commissioner and the commissioners make a request that you have Vision Zero come out. On our last uh, meeting, ANC meeting, one of the things that I raised is that 
there's a construction piece and that there's the traffic safety piece. So I encourage and we will support inviting Vision Zero to come out and address this because the construction, the construction engineering team here doesn't necessarily work on traffic safety. Um, I have to correct you on that, um, Dolly, um, because I can assure you, because um, I've been a part of those meetings, that as the engineer had stated previously, and just so that we're providing correct information to the residents, um, Vision Zero and the traffic engineers are part of the design. And this design internally goes to different divisions, uh, one of the divisions being traffic safety and Vision Zero to make sure that we're also um, providing concepts for traffic safety. Um, right. and, and I've provided you that information. What is the, what is the short term then? I guess I'm- All I'm, in I'm, all, I, 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 all in all, um, DDA will be engaging the ANC um, and the residents when we um, will be getting ready to present the full design to the, to the community. We understand there are some concerns currently due to traffic safety. I'm happy to touch bases with uh, the residents and see what can be done. Um, if we can um, go out and provide again, um, either better signage or better markings or what can be implemented in short term. Um, my email address is syra.molina2 at dc.gov. Syra, I'll drop that in the chat for you. Thank you, Commissioner. And Ms. Griffin, are you able to talk? Yes. It? Okay, go ahead. Yes, okay. Um, what I, I, I remember a meeting about the PEPCO project, and um, they said that everybody was going to come together and see if it can all be done at the same time because this little stretch has just gotten paved and nice to ride up now we're hearing it's going to be torn up again for a long period of time uh, i know dc that might not have anything to do with this but on new hampshire avenue on the maryland side just one block away they have a project going on there and they start in the evening and they go through the night and it's very, very loud. You can hear just this bumping, bumping, bumping all night. And um, I, I don't know if, Mer I don't know if, D does DC have rules that will, will preclude that from happening when this project goes forward because it, it's very disturbing. I'm glad I don't work. If I had to get up in the morning and go to work, I would really be bummed out. And, and I, I know a lot of my neighbors do have to get up and go to work, but it, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just concerned because there's so much construction in our little area, and so, so, some of it, it's some of these problems just seem like they could have been mitigated. That the project with Pepco along Eastern. It took a long time, you know. It 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 was it was quite a while. I don't remember exactly, but the street stayed up, tore up for a long time, and now it's back together again. And now we're here, and it's going to be torn up again. I'm just, I I just would like for the people who are doing all this tearing up to keep 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 the residents in mind. Are you talking about loud ordinances? I think she's speaking of the construction of the road, um, Tiffany. Oh, okay. So there are construction constraints. Okay, we get, we're getting ready to cut off. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll please email me offline. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if you have any, I know we're out of, kind of out of time, but if you have any further questions, please uh, send them to Sarah and she'll get them to us and we can answer those for you. And as it was mentioned earlier, um, when we have the final design completed, we'll be having a public meeting um, to share everything a little more in depth than we did tonight. All right, thank you. Thank you, Department of Transportation. Um, Thank you. Is, yes, anyone have any questions, please uh, send them to us and we will make sure you get an answer. Our next presentation is coming from Greg Maleski. And we're talking about the bicycle program specialist, Department of Transportation. Greg, 
Lex, are you on the line? Yes, he is. Hold on one second. I'm promoting him. Yeah, it takes a minute. Hey, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Wonderful. If you guys don't mind, I'm going to share my screen here. Let me bring up the presentation. Uh, all right. Can you all see my screen? Yes. All right. Awesome. Well, hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Matleski. I'm a bicycle program specialist with DDOT, the District Department of Transportation. Uh, and I'm here to chat with you all tonight about a proposed capital bike share station that we're looking to put uh, within the neighborhood. Uh, so just real quick, uh, going through what bike share is for those that aren't uh, familiar. Well, first, what isn't capital bike share? We are not the scooters. We are not the jump bikes. Let me just get that out of the way right now. A lot of people are confused by what bike share is. Um, those, those are you know shared mobility devices, but we are not them. So what is capital bike share? Believe it or not, Capital Bike Share is a public transit system owned and operated by DDOT and six other local member jurisdictions in Maryland and Virginia. We have over 5,000 bicycles available at over 600 stations. And like any public transit system, it's designed to get you from point A to point B. Um, you know, it's a good way to complement other forms of transportation. You know, you can take the, the take a bike share to the metro, take the metro downtown, take the bike to your destination, uh, solving what we call the last mile problem. Um, capital Bike Share, as I mentioned, is in DC and six other member jurisdictions in Maryland and Virginia. And how to use Cabby. Uh, you can join Capital Bike Share. Uh, we have several different membership types, ranging from a single trip for $2 all the way to an annual membership for $85. Basically, what that membership gives you is unlimited uh, free, let's say unlimited free trips under 30 minutes. Uh, so basically, you can take your bike, uh, you, you get a key. That gives you access to those 5,000 bikes, so 600 stations. You take a bike out, take it to another station, return it. So the more you use it, the cheaper it gets. So um, it's, it's a great thing. Um, <laughs> so why use Capital Bike Share? Of course, it is a, another transportation option in the toolbox. Uh, as I mentioned before, it helps connect folks to, to the Metro Rail and to bus. It's a great way to add physical activity to uh, your daily life. Very important in these days when a lot of folks are staying home. Um, you know, also helps support the district sustainability goals. You know, stops uh, pollution or reduces pollution, greenhouse gases, yada, yada. Save time and money. Uh, and of course, the most important one is having fun. Riding a bike is a lot of fun. Um, so uh, another thing we've added is uh, we've recently reintroduced electronic bikes or electric bikes, also known as e-bikes to Capital Bike Share. Uh, these are called e-assist systems. Basically, um, they provide, uh, there's a small electric motor that provides a little bit of power as you pedal. Uh, so it helps flatten, uh, flatten hills, you know, increase your range. You know, for folks that are kind of nervous or hesitant about getting on a bike for, you know, they think they may be too old or maybe too, maybe not in good enough shape to use it. The e-bike helps uh, make bicycling more accessible. You know, we have over, uh, I think about 700 of them in the region so far, um, and we're adding more by the day. Um, and these are hybrid uh, bicycles. So uh, not only can they be docked at a station like a normal bike, um, but they can also be locked to a um, public bike rack in the public space um, for just an extra dollar. Um, so it helps, you know, we can't have stations everywhere, so this this helps um, you know make biking more accessible. Uh, before I get into the uh, the proposed station, uh, just a little background on how we choose where capital bike share stations go. Uh, so basically, one of the documents we use to help determine um, where to put capital bike share stations is what's called the capital bike share development plan. We recently updated uh, our development plan. Um, I think we published it in May of this year. Um, Basically, what, what the development plan looks at is basically where are people going to ride bikes? Where are they riding now? Where will they ride? Where will we generate revenue? That's mostly for our stations down in the mall, for, for stations that are focused for tourists. Where can we have the biggest impact on health and welfare uh, in people's neighborhoods? And of course, where can we increase access? So the reason I'm here tonight is that this capital bike share development plan um, identified um, the A and C, this, this whole neighborhood as an area for priority for expansion. So we looked at several uh, locations in the neighborhood and found 
um, thought that this location would be best. So this is at Kansas Avenue uh, in Longfellow Street Northwest. So here's a little aerial photo of where we're looking uh, to locate the station. So right now there's basically, a, for folks, there's a, there's a triangle park here, you know, with Kansas Avenue, Longfellow Street, and 2nd Street Northwest. So we're looking to site the station in the curb lane, so basically that parking lane on the east side of Kansas Avenue, just to the north of Longfellow Street. And so what that would look like on the street level uh, is, is just this. So the station is about 52 feet long. That's about two and a half cars worth of parking spaces. Uh, so we would site the station in street or adjacent to the bike lane. Uh, we would repurpose those, those two unzoned parking spaces for that space for 19 uh, bicycles. Uh, and we would delineate the space and separate it from motor traffic with um, white plastic flex posts that help make the station visible um, and keep people, keep motor vehicles from intruding into it. Um, so as I mentioned before, that Capital Bike Share Development Plan, there's a little aerial of, of you know, the greater area that spot right in the middle, that yellow dot, that yellow star, excuse me, uh, that is the proposed location of the bike share station. That dark green circle, that is an area of uh, high priority for expansion. The lighter green circles are the lower priority areas, but as you can see, um, you know, this, this whole area basically has a lot of areas for expansion. So we have several stations, you know, we're, this is kind of a, a cabby dead zone. So there's not a lot of stations nearby. Um, you know, the closest one is about, you know, a third of a mile away. Um, but, you know, the, the major hitters are like the Tacoma Metro. It's about a mile and a third away. It's maybe like a 15 minute bicycle ride. Fort Totten, uh, this is about a mile away. So that's about a 10 to 15 minute bicycle ride um, from this location. And of course, you got Petworth Metro is about one mile and two thirds, 15 to 20 minutes. So, uh, so this station, you know, we're hoping can help uh, expand access to the area. Um, get folks out of cars, get folks to where they want to go uh, by bicycle and provide greater access to Capital Bike Share. Because as, as I mentioned, it's a public transit service, it's taxpayer funded, so it's, it's your service. So we want to, we wanna, you know, put it in the hands of, of as many people as we can. So um, that's, that's my presentation there. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about the proposed location or Capital Bike Share as a whole. Uh, so again, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg, Thank you. so much. Great question. Yes. Uh, could you go back two slides for me, please? Yes, of course. Yes, that one. Okay, I know exactly where it is. I was I was opposed to it, but now that I'm looking at this and I know exactly where this is and the uh, amount of traffic, um, uh, th this is this is uh, more than acceptable. Uh, so my question to you is this, Greg? You see those houses right there um, in the in the in the back set of this this photo you got? Yes. Okay, those those homes right there. Ha just by 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 chance, have, has Capital Bike Share had any conversations with those people? Not yet. Or you just don't you you don't do that instead of a station. So we, we do uh, public outreach when we do site stations in neighborhoods. So, um, so folks on this call, I reached out to Commissioner Johnson. I, I sent her the proposed location about a month or so ago. Right. Um, oh, sorry. And the majority of individuals have said that they prefer this in this spot. Is that right, Tim? So Thank you. Thank you for sharing. If you don't. Staying on this slide for a second. This is Commissioner Brooks. This abuts my SMD. And so I'm wondering if anyone has addressed the residents at first in Longfellow or gotten their views on whether or not they want it in their community as well. Well, I, I put out a poll and the majority of individuals said that they would like this in their in this spot who are those individuals? That's what I'm asking you. So someone reached out to residents really? in SMD, but not to me. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Because the I, residents that I spoke to weren't aware of it. I put out a poll on Nextdoor and on my social media pages, and they all said that they would concur. It was over 50% that said that they would concur. There so were those, a few individuals
individuals that said that they will like it into a different area, but they did not give and specify where they would like that to be. Okay, so the residents, the residents right. that I spoke to wouldn't be residents that were on next door or on your social media. So have you reached out to the residents that are living there that aren't on your social media or on next door? I did not. And hey, this is I, I have I did not reach out. Those, those homes in this picture. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, this is Greg again. So yeah, my, my public outreach was was only limited to um, to the commissioner for this SMD. Um, I apologize for, for not reaching out to, to you, Commissioner Brooks. Um, but as, as the as Commissioner Johnson had stated, you know, she did do some outreach on our behalf uh, to constituents. And we did receive some positive uh, feedback on this location. So we're, we're happy to, you know, proceed with this, with this location if the ANC um, feels comfortable with it. Um, sorry, loud driver. So it's um, just to follow to my question. Just a follow up to my question. Fellow uh, commissioners. Perry, you're breaking up. Yeah, Perry, your connection is going in and out. So my my concern, while well, Perry's coming, it looks like he froze up. So I'll yeah. I I think All that right. um using Tiffany's social media and next door is one means of reaching people. I don't necessarily know that that reaches the majority of people. Um, one of my constituents has just posted something that says she lives on second, well, I know she lives on second street and she's a, probably a block away from this and wasn't aware of the proposal. So- Commissioner, Commissioner Brooks, I'll, I just wanna just real quick remind the commission that Tiffany's resolution, draft resolution on this and notice to all the other members of the commission went out October 3rd. I know when it went out. What? That's not my point. Well, I know when it went out. You. I'm asking, did she in fact address neighbors in the area that is impacted? She sent it to the commission as a whole based on her findings. So yeah. now I'm asking Greg, if he reached out to them, if yeah. no one reached out to them, then that should be a consideration. Allison, and please understand, I, Commissioner, the best this, this is what happened with us in Lot 69. All right, it, there's a reason for this. And, and, and yes, oh. People, people who are on next door or on, on, on Twitter or whatever the case may be, may not be those who have been there for 20, 25 years. Commissioner so Red, When we asked this question, I thank the young man for being very honest in his response. Uh, that's not to say that this is not a great idea nor a great location. Exactly. And it's not to say that Commissioner Johnson didn't do something responsible. I'll just, it, can I raise a point of procedure? I have done the best uh, the before our planning meeting. So the majority of my constituents. Commissioner Red, can I ask? Please do not sit here. Please do not sit here and say that I did not reach my constituents. I, I did, did not say that. that. No I said, said that just the opposite. They didn't reach my what you did was responsible. Thank you. But what is necessary needed and what, what, what I know about life 69 and my, my experience on this commission is that they are immediately affected. And it's, it's, it's probably a great idea. Perry. No, don't be offended. Just, right. yes, sir. In fact, Tiffany, I don't even yes, think it's an obligation to reach my constituents. I think it was the capital bike share's responsibility if they didn't even reach everybody that's on Second Street, that that's telling, and it's not a reflection of you at all, Commissioner Red and Commissioner Brooks. No, it's not. That we that we not filibuster that we allow people to have order here. I just wanted to finish my prior thought, which was that the commissioners were notified by Commissioner Johnson on October third. I think that if you had constituents like who you were concerned would be affected by the location, you should have reached, I would hope that you would reach out to your constituents back in early October and bring those comments to our planning meeting so that we could make those changes in anticipation of our earlier meeting rather than waiting until tonight to, 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 to be surprised about it. I'd also like to take a moment to read the, since I've been reading the chat all night to read the comments in the chat from the community 
from Ashley. She says, I live within view of this proposed cabbie location. First time I'm hearing of it, but I would be in support. Um, Adam Thomas says, I'm in Man Port Manor Park and I would support this location. Those are the two community comments. We've so had. I think you're missing my point. And we my had, point is a reflection Evan, of we had a, at all. A majority of do. individuals who approved of this site at this location. It was over 50%. But it was 50% of the people that you are in contact with. So first of all, I just like to be able to finish my thought. Tiffany, my comment is not directed towards you and your effort. So I'm gonna say that for the third time. My point is, regardless of when you sent out a resolution, regardless of who you reached out to, it was, it has it was been a group of people that have been left all, out by Allison, It was not a resolution, first of all. I polled the individuals who live in my community to ask them. I also went and asked for their um, purview via hand sent messages. So I'm looking at the data. The data says that the majority of the people want this. Okay. okay. I'm not debate. Okay, I give up. Hold on, let me I'm trying to say something that everyone cuts me off. And uh, commissioners, it's commissioners. Personal. It's not about Tiffany. It's not about what Tiffany did. The point that I'm making is being missed. But I'll, I'm, I'm going to be quiet now. No, no, no. Hold on, commissioners. Uh, Allison, go ahead on and finish your thought because you was cut off three or four times. So please go ahead on and no one interrupt what uh, Allison is saying. Allison, complete your thought, please. I appreciate that Tiffany brought this to our attention. Otherwise, I never would have known about it. The reason I never would have known about it is because Capital Bike Share didn't make all parties informed. That wasn't Tiffany's responsibility, nor was it my responsibility if I wasn't even made aware of it by Capital Bike Share. In the same way ABRA makes abutting jurisdictions aware when they're uh, hearings or other people, DCRA makes us aware of permitting issues that are, are abutting our jurisdictions, Capital Bike Share should have done the same thing. It has nothing to do with Tiffany, nothing. So I'm gonna say that for like- Greg, my, my apologies for this. a reflection of Tiffany. I am not judging Tiffany and her efforts. What I'm saying is that while she made the effort, it didn't reach all of the impacted people. Okay, Capital Bike Share. Yeah, hey, uh, sorry, this is Greg again. Um, yeah, my, my apologies, Commissioner, for, for not reaching out to you. Um, and I say that not because, you know, I want you to, that I'm angry. It's so that you learn the next time that if this is going to impact a group that abuts another jurisdiction, they should be made aware by you, not by the other commissioner, not in our planning meeting. You know, I'm sorry. I, 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 I have monthly meetings that give me the opportunity to speak to my constituents, I could bring that to their attention if this all this timing all lands out, I mean, works out. And in this case, it didn't, Evan. So therefore, I couldn't. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Aaron, do we have any more, anything else in the chat box? So I'm, I'm watching the chat tonight. Oh, okay, uh, I'm Brenda. thank you. I'm That's so okay. Sorry. Um, I read on toss. We have from uh, Ashley Spoonagle. I'm in Riggs Park, and I support this location. Smiley faced. Okay. That's it. And is it your contention that because I, I was it. reached out directly that you feel I should have reached out to you? No, okay. that's not my contention. No, my contention is that if Capital Bike Share wants to do something on an abutting property, they should notify both of us. I'm not okay. suggesting that you should have, I keep saying it over and over again. I'm not suggesting that you should have done anything other than what you did. My only comment was not everyone, for example, in my SMD would be on your social media. All of them might not be on next door. So you reached out and you, did what you were supposed to do, but that may have left out some people. And that's okay. not your I just, fault. I was, I was okay, Tiffany, to where you were coming from. Tiffany, Tiffany and Allison, you all need to discuss this among yourselves offline. Um, um, 
Greg have apologized for the mistake that he made. Allison reminded him, you know, the next time, you know, what needs to be done. So I appreciate if you two commissioners will get together and discuss this because we got to move on uh, because the same thing has been said over and over again. I appreciate that so much. So do we have Thank anything you. else, Evans, in the chat? Um, I'm yes. fine with that. We have uh, from Janelle, could Capital Bike Share put flyers on the door of the residence on 2nd Street? And from Uchenna Evans, I think Capital Bike Share understands Commissioner Brooks's point. I believe they are going to set um, the um, signage out so that everyone is aware. Okay, uh, we have Bike Share on the line. Tiffany, would you let him answer, please? Hey everybody. So in terms of flyers on doors, um, to, to be quite honest, that's, that's not um, a typical thing that we at uh, DGOT and Capital Bike Show do for new station installations, but you know, for something like this, I work with our community engagement team. Uh, I know Syra is, is on the call from before um, on, on getting the word out about this. And again, Commissioner Brooks, I apologize for, for not um, including you uh, on the message uh, regarding this location. Um, I, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try not to make that mistake again. Uh, but, you know, if, if there is a desire for, for more outreach, we're certainly happy to help. Uh, but if you have any, you know, specific concerns or, or issues with this location, I'm happy to address them. On this call or off. Okay, thank you. Now, Tiffany, the reason why I wanted him to answer that question instead of you, because he had a totally different answer than what you had. And that's the reason why I asked you, and I, and I apologize for that, but there was a reason that I wanted him to answer the question. All no right. worries. All right. Thank you, sweetheart. You have anything else, Miss Tiffany? No, I have nothing okay. else. We have anything else, uh, Evans and chat? Not as of right now, Brenda. All right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Moving right along, our next presentation is Julie Patton uh, Lawson. And she's from the mayor office of Clean City. Hold on, Julie, I'll get you up in one second. Hi. Um, first, I'll start with this happy Halloween week. Um, I think a few people really appreciate this. Now I'm gonna take it off. <laughs> um, so, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, good evening. Uh, as your 4B neighbor, um, you've had me a few times. I'm the director of the mayor's office of the Clean City, and we have an exciting project that we've been working on within the um, commission boundaries, as well as some neighboring commissions that I just wanted to give mostly the commissioners an update about so that you can answer questions on any residents. Um, we were approached a few months ago by the Environmental Protection Agency, the US EPA's Trash Free Waters Program to do a project related to um, identifying how much litter in our communities comes from household trash disposal and not just people throwing trash on the ground, but how do we actually throw away our trash at home? Um, so for the last 10 weeks, our office has been monitoring trash levels in five neighborhoods in DC, um, specifically in alleys and stocking your trash cans. Um, and in a couple of weeks, we are about to distribute a bunch 8,000 stickers to homes uh, that we are asking everyone to put on their trash can. So this packet will show up on doorknobs um, in certain neighborhoods with a sticker asking you to put it on your trash can. And it has four tips about keeping your lid closed and not overfilling the can, bagging your trash before you put it in the can, but don't bag your recyclables. Those need to stay loose. Um, not putting your trash out until shortly before collection your collection day, and then calling 311 or letting 311 know if you need your can repaired from rat chewing or other damage. Um, and then we're gonna be evaluating 
the reaction, uh, the response to this for the next 10 weeks after that. Um, so we have one of the neighborhoods that we've, that is part of this is Brightwood. So there's a short part of the south part of 4B across Commissioner Red's and potentially Commissioner Johnson's and Brooks's SMDs that are going to get these stickers the week of November 9th. Um, so I wanted to let you all know that this was happening because you may get questions. Anyone who gets the sticker can refer to our website at cleancity.dc.gov. Um, I hope also that you might be interested in helping us distribute these 8,000 stickers. Um, we will have a team of volunteers from other DC government agencies, as well as our adopt a block participants in the areas who will help us drop these at doors. We're not gonna engage with residents, it's just dropping it at doors um, so that we're safe for COVID purposes um, the week of the November 9th. There will also be more information on our website for the whole city as well as social media across a number of agencies. Um, and then we're hoping that if this shows that it is successful at reducing litter levels in our alleys and neighborhoods, that we can do this citywide next year. Um, EPA is ex excited to do this um, citywide and then even take the lessons that we're learning here and deploy it across cities across the country. Um, that is the extent of my presentation and I am happy to take any questions. Commissioners? Okay. Yes, question. And, and, and thank you. And I'm sorry, I was a constituent was calling. Uh, Ms. Lawson, um, this program, uh, it's only, is it only dealing with the back alley cans and, and the like that you all are, are working with? We're only working with the Department of Public Works trash cans, so your green trash can. Um, we're not dealing with apartments and condos. The green trash cans. Just the green trash cans. We're not addressing recycling. Right, right. Although we're and, and taking it, note of that. And, and I, I ask because uh, the, the litter you were speaking of, I have a, a, a specific receptacle that is dumped by DPW that is so full. I want to show it to you right now but it's so full every week and those public round deals is is there a connection of some sort with those because i know it's it's home and i've surveilled because my residents some of my constituents have have asked me to address it in some way i've surveilled and i know where the trash is being dumped from so is 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 there a part of your department that deals with this because the rats are, 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 are living very large over there or yeah. ninth and, and Madison. Ninth and Madison. Okay. So um, if you have overflowing public trash cans, please let me know. Um, DPW is working as hard as they can under pandemic circumstances to work on the cleanup, the collection of those, but we know we have a lot of households and businesses that dump trash in those cans. And we can send the enforcement team out to find out who those folks are and uh, do some education. I see that is a very you see those right there? household trash. Yes. So, yeah, I think we need to be cited. Yeah, because we this need is happening citation. quite often. Do you, um, so we Thank can flag that one. Um, so Perry, uh, right there where you're talking about at Ninth and Madison, if you come through there uh, about five, um, be on the corner about 520 or 525, that's what time I get at that corner to go to work. You will see the young lady bringing her trash out of the house yeah. every day, putting it in that trash can. But um, Julie, you was talking about uh, contacting DPW. Mm -hmm. I contact the PDW about my trash can on my corner, mm -hmm. okay? It took weeks, months, almost a year to get that trash can removed. Now, I don't know what uh, you all are doing with Clean City, 
But this is totally city, and I go around the entire city. It's totally okay. filthy. What's going on? It's filth. It's just filth. There's really the trash cans. The trash cans need to be empty on the corners more than once a week. Okay. Um, dog poop, you know, is being thrown in 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 the in the holes in the ground. You know, uh, you see rats coming from under the trash can, from around the trash can, and you know, you all say, you know. Uh, we keep this clean. No, I'm not going to agree with DPW on this because I, I go too many places. I'm, I'm on, like I said, I go all, entire city a lot of times. And um, if you all are emptying trash cans, when do you empty them? I know mine used to get emptied once a week on Sunday evenings, Sunday nights about 11 o'clock. But I finally had to get the mayor involved in order to get the trash can moved because the DPW wasn't doing anything. And I got tired. We live in a neighborhood. We don't, you complain about rats, but the DPW don't do anything to help stop the rats. And the possums and the, the raccoons. The raccoons, yes, raccoons are eating up our trash cans. But we have to put traps at ourselves because the city gonna charge us $500 for a trap. Why? What? Yes, it's five hundred dollars. If you get the city yeah. to put out a trap, it's five hundred dollars. That's right. Um, okay, so I'll just I'll respond to that briefly. Um, if you have uh, a rat concern, you can report that to three one one, and GC Health will come out and inspect <laughs> and abate. Um, and they can also you can organize your neighbors to um, set up a block wide abatement. Um, for overflowing public cans, and the, again, DPW, uh, and if you can, DDS services. Uh, Tiffany, is that you again? <laughs> I don't see him. <laughs> Give us time to finish, sweetheart. <laughs> Go ahead on, Julie. <laughs> uh, so for the DPW cans, um, we well, understand you, that there have are. You, have you talked? Go ahead, Julie. Go ahead, um, Julie. We, I'm not going to comment on, on your plastic bottle. Yeah, um, we sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for public hands, if they are overflowing um, on a regular basis, again, if it's obvious public or um, illegal dumping trash, just let us know. We can let the enforcement team know and they can go give it a check. We are working under pandemic conditions for emptying those cans. Um, you can request new cans through 311. You can also request removal of the cans through 311. Okay, uh, the new can, $65 if we request because they use at once, once upon a time, not a few, few months ago, cans were $65. So if a uh, neighbor requests a can, it's gonna cost them $65. Okay, so that's going to the residential cans. And yes, the residential cans are 65 They all of this need to be told to the resident because they're going to believe, okay, I can call and get a new can. No, you can't. Well, so uh, there's two different cans I'm talking about here. The first is the public litter cans. Okay. You request that through 311. It is a review process and it takes a while. Um, and they are pretty picky because they don't want to change the route that they are collecting okay. on. Um, if you need a new can for your home, um, there are, it is $65 if you just, your can got destroyed and you, or you lost it in a blaze of glory situation. Um, if it is damaged by rats, however, you can get a repaired can. And if you're a senior, there are discount programs. At what age? And then there are also, um, you can also purchase additional cans and DPW will collect from those um, if you need them from a hardware store. I have a question or a comment. This is Commissioner Huff for BL9. So I wanna say thank you, um, Julie and DPW and Department of Health with working with the residents over here. We've done some alley cleanings um, and identified cans. So with the cans, there were like 90 cans that were to either be um, inspected because of 
tops off, which could be replaced or repaired, then that's free. Or there were the rats that ate the bottom, which, or ate through the bottom, which could also be replaced for free. But there are concerns with the constituents that they are not breaking their cans, they are not dumping their cans, they're not putting them back, and they're not, you know. So um, I guess one concern I have is that residents have to pay for damages they not, they're not doing. Um, secondly, when it comes to the public space cans, um, in my SMD, we identified collectively with neighbors, there was a white van of some sort that would hit all six cans around the playground and they would drop furniture, they would dump all kinds of stuff. So their tag, a picture, someone got a picture of the tag and so they were then fined, that person was fined. Um, but overall, I think that's the concern about the cans. The other thing about the cans, even though I noted 90 cans with addresses, you have to put down that W number. So, and, and, and so that number always has to correlate with your 311 um, so that they know whose can it is. And a lot of times cans do get in other neighbor's yards. They don't belong to the person at that address, even though they're marked 518 or whatever. Um, so that's what uh, my experience has been uh, most recently because I knew that, um, you know, with the, with the COVID, there was not any alley cleaning and things like that. But um, you all have come back out to pick it up. Um, thank you for the gloves, the bags, and all of the rakes. I've got them all in my yard and I'm ready to push them away. But I just did want to say thank you. One last thing. I've seen in other communities, they have a bubble over top of these public space cans. I'm going to be asking for the, the tops. That would prevent people from overstuffing them. If we're going to work with the government agencies to deal with the rat issue, um, we have to come up with ways that the rats can't eat through the trash. You know, it, it's, an open, it's an open fiasco at night, you know, when it's dark. The rats go in these cans, they go in our trash cans, people are afraid to go in their backyards. So we have to work together. I'm not sure if back in the day we used to have metal cans. I know it's a, I know it's a cost, but is there any way to consider having metal inside of those um, green cans? Rats can't eat through that metal, but they can eat through the green can and residents have to replace their can. So thank you for my comment. and. Um, I will be looking to see what can happen so that we can work together. Commissioner Parks, can I read the community questions from the yes, chat? Yes, you can. I was getting ready to ask. Yes. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and prioritize the ones that are about the presentation we heard tonight and then move on to the others. Um, from Debbie Winston, how can you volunteer for the distribution of stickers? Please email us at cleancity at dc.gov. I'll drop that in the chat for everybody to, everybody to follow. Um, As I where mentioned, can, it'll be the week of November 9th. Okay. Um, and then where can we find a link to learn more about this program? Uh, that the page about this program is not up yet, but it will be posted at cleancity.dc.gov. And while I'm speaking of that website, I want to highlight we have a brand new site for the adopt -a block program that you can also find at cleancity.dc.gov. And it's super engaging and full of fun facts and I hope everyone will sign up. Okay. All right. And then moving on to the other ones. What can be done about trash from vacant properties and construction sites in the neighborhood? Uh, um, yeah, for the one off problem locations, just send us an email. My email is julie.lawson at dc.gov. And I'm happy, happy to help you triage that. Um, okay. Yeah, All right. it's gonna end up falling with DCRA mostly, but I'm happy to help. I'm gonna ask Janelle to save, I think yours is a community comment question about masks and gloves. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, ask you to save that for the community comment. Um, we had a comment, I just had a recycling can and a trash can with rat holes replaced at no charge in ward one where I rent a home. I had a rat abatement team respond in three days to my home in Riggs Park. Both issues were called into 311. That is from 
P. Griffin. I also want to second the 311 request. I have had prompt service on overflowing public trash cans. That's something I routinely report on 311, and I'd encourage everybody else to do the same because that's worked really well. Um, from the Q&A, seems like the trash patterns are off right now with people working at home, kids at home all day, people taking the time. Is this project specifically in response to that dynamic, or was there a problem before? Um, this project came about before the pandemic. Um, it is interesting to see the change, any influence based on people being at home. Um, on the flip side, we don't have any street sweeping, which is allowing us to get a better handle on the level, level of um, baseline street litter. Um, so in some respects, it's positive that we have reduced services. Um, but yeah, this was not related to the pandemic. Um, and we are really looking at it from a just what are people's day to days like. Okay. And Janelle clarified their question, so I think it is more relevant now. There's an increase in litter in the neighborhood on 3rd between Rittenhouse and Sheridan, particularly PPE, an increase in PPE trash. Is there anything you can do, and have you noticed an increase in PPE trash in general? Um, yeah, so that uh, that's a favorite block of mine next around the corner from my son's school. Um, but we don't, we have, that's not part of where we've been studying. Um, I know that that part is part of the parks, uh, the Riggs, uh, Riggs Road Main Street and Parks Main Street. Um, so there should be a clean team working on that. Um, there's all that block is also adopted um, by the Manor Park Community Association, but I don't know that they've been keeping up with their cleanups lately the way that they used to. Uh, so perhaps that's an opportunity to clean up to pick that up. Um, we're happy to have a conversation with some of the businesses on that block, um, the Barber and, and Sundab and the um, Goldies and uh, Nicolores um, and the, all the others around there to see if there's anything that we can do. I do know that we've had a number of problems with illegal use of the public cans on that block as well. Judy, on Rittenhouse Street right there, Georgia Rittenhouse, um could you have someone to check in because um i don't know what to that's my area scott's area and um we need dpw to check into the area and because there's a lot of homeless that stays there that stays on the corner and uh, the trash can just overflow daily so could you please have them to check into georgia and rittenhouse for the shopping center and maybe uh, ask those um, uh, store owners, could they help with cleaning up on the outside? Yeah, we can absolutely do that, George. Thank, thank you. I wanted to go back on uh, Commissioner Huff's comment about the tops on the public cans, if we have a minute. Uh, yes, those definitely reduce the amount of illegal dumping um, in those cans um, and I've been working, especially around apartment buildings to try to get the tops put on. There is a cost to those. So there's, we've run into some resistance and right now the DC budget is hampered pretty significantly for things, um, new enhancements like that. But uh, we are aware of it and we're looking at different ways of doing trash cans, public trash cans around the district to address that. One other comment I wanted to make um, in, in working with constituents to get the new cans, I've been informed that new cans will not be available till mid, possibly mid-November. So if residents are looking to get a new trash can, um, they are not able to um, until possibly mid-November. So then, so I asked the resident, well, do you want to, because you can flip your can over, they can take it away. But it's better, to, I think, to have a can as opposed to have a bag. Uh, at least the uh, rodents have a little more of a challenge, maybe, to get in the can. So um, the order for the cans won't be till November, mid-November. OK, absolutely. It's better to put it in a can, even if it doesn't yeah. have a top. Keeps um, the wind from taking I see one final community okay. question in the chat, and then and then I think if Commissioner Parks wants to recommend recognize more commissioners, but I'll read the community question. Has the city looked at the trash and dumping around the park between Kansas and Blair Roads Northwest? Kansas and Blair, that's the school. 
at the school or at the Pepco building? Or at Gallagher and Hewley's old building? At the park. It says the park, so I'd assume the school, given the most. I don't, I don't think it's the school. I think it's um, Fort Slocum, right? Near the Pepco building is the chat. Okay. Near the Pepco building, yeah. Um, well, I know they just cut all that back, uh, all the vegetation back. We can take a look. Um, we have had significant, and I know Commissioner Johnson is a fan of this, significant improvement at 6,000 block of Kansas um, with the property owner at the warehouse there is now um, doing weekly cleanups and cutting back there. Um, dumping at the Pepco building, we'll have to take a look. That has not been on my radar yet. Okay, we have about one more minute. This is Allison, um, Commissioner Parks. I have a, a question, a, really just a follow up. Is it okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, Julie, LaRoya asked you a question about litter cans, and I'm not quite sure if I heard you correctly. Um, I know I heard you say that it takes, you know, quite a while for 311 to make a decision, but did you say it was that you could help with that, or did you say it was based on their route? Because I have two requests that I put in in 2019, and the decision date to close the 2311 request was 2021. So that is for the um, public litter cans. It's yes. a 270 day uh, yes. agreement. Yes. They have, DPW has routes that they collect on those public cans every night. And um, they prioritize bus stops, commercial corridors, um, and other active places. They don't like to put public cans in residential areas because it exacerbates the household dumping. Um, and okay. It also drags them off the route and slows them down to collect everything else. Okay, we were interested in having a litter can on Riggs Road approaching Fort Totten Metro. Um, there are no litter cans along the majority of that commuter route for people that are walking to the Metro and it creates a lot of garbage along Riggs Road. Um, and I know that that is technically considered residential, but um, I'm interested in, in knowing if there's anything that can be done to sort of overlook the residential aspect of that block, given that it's leading to the subway station. Okay, I can um, I can look into that. Um, the process is to ask DPW and they make that decision, but I can ask them and say that this was this came up. Okay, because DC bilingual, there's a school there, right? right. And the kids walk to the metro and drop their you know their kids, right? They don't right. throw their soda cans wherever. Um, or what have you. And so I would just like to get some consideration for that. Yeah. Also, the, the second request that I put in was for Eastern Avenue um, between Quintana Place and maybe Peabody. You know, you have people that are walking down the street from the McDonald's and, you know, the liquor store, and then suddenly their garbage is in front of someone's home. And so if we could at least have one litter can, that would be helpful. Okay. Um, I will. Yeah, that should be near a route because of the bus line. So okay. I'll, I will, I'll flag that one as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I do see Ashley clarified that it's across the storage units and community gardens. She means Fort Slocum Pocket Park. Um, that is a National Park Service concern. And um, we have been talking to them a lot, but that's not a DC government concern. Do we have anything else, Evans? Evan, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, next presentation is uh, uh, Pedro Development, proposed development at uh, 6928 Maple Street, Northwest. Bringing them up now. Thank you, Ju thank you, Julie, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity oh, to talk. That's about okay. We'll have you again. I I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you in. No, I don't know whether you want to come back or not, but <laughs> we'll have you again. I'll see you in a couple in an hour at community comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if I could just pr pr provide a thirty second intro. Yes, you work. can. Um, so, for the benefit of everyone else. Um, 
this proposed development, um, I, ha I held a community meeting with a presentation um, on September 3rd. Um, I, I believe we'll, we'll, we'll hear their presentation and what they have taken from the community's comments that they heard in that meeting uh, in today's presentation. Um, and, um, and just to note that, um, you know, this is part of the process for bringing it here for the rest of the commissioners now to, to, to hear where they are in the process and we'll go from there, but there's, there's for the benefit of the, the public, there's no, there's no vote scheduled on this yet. It's, this is informative still. So with that, um, I'll pass it over. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Eli Boric. I'm the director of development with Petra Development. And um, Jeff, I wanted to thank you for your continued uh, coordination efforts here. And thank you, everyone else, for giving the, us, us the opportunity to present tonight. Um, we are a Washington, D.C. based developer, uh, primarily of affordable housing. We build uh, affordable housing projects of various types around the country. We have projects in Maryland, Virginia, uh, potentially West Virginia, as well as Texas. Um, we have a few hundred units uh, stabilized and under our, our own management arm in the district. So we, uh, we entitle, develop, and um, are long-term owners of affordable housing. Uh, the project we're discussing tonight is, our potential project is at 6928 Maple Street. And um, as Jeff said, we had a meeting last month with some of the more localized residents, uh, got some particular feedback and uh, tried to incorporate that into uh, some of our plans, which we uh, have tonight to show to share with everyone. Um, and as I said last meeting, I just wanted to make one thing clear is that we're not planning on building a big white building. This is only for uh, uh, massing purposes. So the uh, obviously since this is a historic district we'll need to go through both ANC approval as well as historic preservation approval so before we got to that point we wanted to uh, present to everyone with massing studies and and uh, get feedback and react to, to that feedback um, with additional massing models so with that being said i'm going to turn it over to laura who is our project architect here who has a presentation uh, for you all Hi, I'm Laura Fernandez. I'm with Petra Design Studio. And we really appreciated all the feedback that we received, as Eli mentioned, at the meeting last month. And we've incorporated a lot of that into the plans um, that I'm going to show tonight. Some of the major points that we heard from the community members was focused on the streetscape and the open space, as well as the design of the existing house. So that's what we'll be focusing on. on today. So this is an open maple. And now I'm going to show um, 3D axon view, which as Eli mentioned, I'm just going to this separately. This is the proposed building here at the corner of Vine and Maple. We have existing buildings shown in this 3D axon view, as well as the proposed buildings on Vine Street. And as you can see, the building scale and massing really fits into the context of what's been approved um, and what exists in this area. And some so the moves that were made here is we're, we're stepping back the massing along Maple to open it up to provide a uh, wider streetscape, sidewalk, landscaping, as well as to open up the views for the existing structure that is on the site currently that will be relocated to this corner. Um, and it kind of breaks down the scale of the building to fit into the neighborhood and to match this existing house. The other thing to note is that the parking is tucked under the building and is screened by uh, fencing and a gate so it's not so visible from the street. And as I mentioned, a lot of the comments were related to the streetscape. So I'm just going to zoom in on the sidewalk layout here. So we've got Maple Street and Vine Street. Uh, Maple Street currently has a four foot sidewalk, but that's 
will be expanded to be larger. This is showing six feet, which can um, accommodate two people walking very easily. We're also keeping the, the trees and the grass along the curb here, as well as pulling the building off of the property line to provide more landscaped area and some privacy for the building. And I'll get into that later with some 3D renderings that really show what that looks like. The existing house is moved to the corner here um, to relate more to the neighborhood. And the proposed sidewalk on Vine Street will match what's been approved to the north. So we've got a nice generous sidewalk as well as ample green space off of Vine. And now we're gonna get into some renderings here. So up in the top left corner, you can see the existing view along Maple, and this is the existing house that's sitting on the site. That house will be moved to the corner and from the same view here, looking down the street, you can see the gate and the fencing blocking the view of the parking, which is tucked under the building here. And then that generous sidewalk with landscaping all the way down that provides an opportunity to have planters and small flowering trees, as well as the existing street trees, and really opens the building up uh, as it steps down the street. And you can see the corner of that existing house at the, um, at the far end here. And again, the building, uh, the materials haven't been decided yet. We're just showing white at this point to get an idea of massing and what that would feel like. And the windows will be further refined as we get further into the design. Jumping ahead here. Um, we're now going to show a view um, from the other direction on Maple. So this is the um, corner of Vine and Maple here. There's a proposed building going in at this corner. So we're showing that as though it's built. And you can really see how that existing house um, sits at the corner. And we've refined the design of the house a little bit to make it really work with that corner. So there's there's three windows at this facade base, facing Vine where the current building only has two. Um, and the um, entrance is designed to work with this corner. And this really highlights that existing house and shows the proposed building. The background is very green. We're thinking there could be vines growing up the side of the building. So that it really is a green backdrop to this house. And now we're looking from Vine Street, looking towards the back of the building. And one of the main elements of this site is that there's a very large existing heritage tree. And we worked with an arborist who did a study of all the trees on the site and found that this tree um, is a heritage tree and will remain on the site and will provide an open space for that tree to really flourish in its existing location. And that provides an opportunity to open up this space as an open space for the public um, at, the, at the side of the building in the back of the existing house. And now back at that front corner, now this is focused just kind of on the existing house here. You can see that um, we've got three windows on the side facing vine and we flip the entrance to be at the um, inside of the house, the stairs and the inside so that we can have a large corner window here. This also, um, the details will be refined as we get into the design more, um, but we really wanted to show what this house would look like at the corner. And then zooming in a little closer to the entrance of that house, the existing building is connected to the proposed building by a small glass connection piece here that would be part of the proposed building. And since that house is pulled back from the corner, that provides more opportunity for landscaping and green space and, and seating for the public. Now we'll zoom in on some sidewalk views to really show the view as though you're walking down the sidewalk. You can see that six feet is very generous, is very wide. You can fit two people very comfortably across that. And then we've got space for trees along the street and landscaping 
providing some privacy for the building. The entrance is also set back from the street, which provides this planter area here for trees and, and plants. And then lastly, just looking um, in the other direction here. Um, looking again down the sidewalk at the streetscape. And just to close, we have um, a precedent from a, a similar project in, on Wisconsin Avenue that had an existing structure on the site and this existing house was moved to a new location on the site and a new building was built at the corner and that, that also has a small connection between the two buildings. So you can see that the existing house um, in this project was restored and was moved uh, very similar to what we're proposing with this project. And that is the end of the presentation. Are there any questions? So uh, Laura, I just wanted to um, kind of reiterate for, for everyone that was on the call last time and, and give, them, give everyone who wasn't on the call the information about uh, unit counts. This will be a, uh, we hope it will be a 68 unit building. 100% of the units will be um, rented to afford, uh, um, uh, housing choice voucher program tenants. So 100% of these units are, are going to be affordable units. I see some questions coming in in the chat. Uh, Jeff, should I start to answer those or do you want to kind of curate or um, how do you want me to handle those? Well, it's, it's, I guess, up to Commissioner Parks as the chair of the meeting to decide oh, um, how she wants to do that and whether she wants to take ANC Commissioner comments, questions first. Sure. I'll, I'll defer to her. Thank you. Commissioner Parks, you're on mute. I'm just a talking and I'm on mute, huh? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You know, this um, this diagram that you all have given this view, it just made me want to sell my house and move there. <laughs> it is wonderful. Thank you for this. Thank you. But anyway, commissioners, you all have any comments? Brenda. No comments. We have questions. I'm sorry. Brenda. Yes. I have okay. a question. Yes. Go ahead. OK, thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Um, we had sent some questions or Jeff had sent some questions over and we got some information back. And based on the last meeting and those answers, um, I just wanted to follow up because you've indicated that you're relying on private financing for the project and that the project will be 100% affordable housing via the housing voucher program. I want to understand where the obligation is for the housing to be affordable? I mean, is this a, an agreement with the community or is it rooted in some sort of covenant of the land or is it tied to the project? Um, where's the obligation for the affordability? So we have uh, worked with the housing authority for quite some time on our other projects and we've actually tried to get them to agree to uh, um, sign some sort of an agreement with us to provide uh, tenants for our units, but we have as of yet not been able to get them to put together or um, pursue any agreement with us. Um, we have, again, several other, several hundred other units in the city that are um, under this, basically it's the same situation uh, in Brightford Park, 16th Street Heights, and um, Adam Morgan, we're building a building on Wisconsin Avenue in Dover Park as well. Um, you know, if you have <laughs> if you have any contacts or any influence at the Housing Authority, we would be more than happy to um, discuss this with them again with your assistance. Um, we have tried to do that for the past two years, um, and we haven't gotten them to put together or sign any agreement with us. So. Absent an agreement like that, are you still committed to having 100% of the units go to voucher holders? And um, 
that is our that is our business model. That is what we do. That's um, we you know we provide housing for um, the the people who need it most in the city, and um, it's sort of unfortunate from our perspective that we haven't been able to get the city to kind of get on board with this. But um, they had no relationships like this before we started building uh, in the city. And it seems like they kind of didn't quite know what to do with us. Um, and I guess they still don't quite know what to do with us. But we work with the Housing Authority. They have various programs that uh, provide funding for these uh, housing vouchers. Uh, we work heavily with the VA. We have a building that's almost entirely um, VA housing vouchers. Um, so we, we work with a variety of, you know, any, anyone basically who, who provides vouchers, we work closely with and um, try to provide these units to their tenants. And how, one final question for me, how long is the commitment that you would be renting these units to voucher holders? Uh, as long as they want to stay. So it would just be the first line of people who move in and not- No, out. no, as long as, as long as they want to stay and, and any subsequent tenant after them. So, you know, we have, obviously there's quite a bit of uh, tenant turnover generally in, in units in the district. and. There's a little bit less turnover when it comes to vouchers, uh, voucher tenants, but um, uh, we, we've had certainly quite a quite a lot of turnover in our other units over the past two years, and and we we continue to rent to uh, Housing Choice Voucher Program tenants, uh, you know, after after the initial tenant. This isn't just a, you know, an an upfront deal with the, the housing authority or, or or something of that nature. The, the units are marketed and intended for uh, continued uh, housing choice voucher program tenants. Anyone else? Thank you. I, Brett, Commissioner Parks, if there are no other commissioner questions, I can read through the community comments in the yes, chat and in the Q&A. Yes, you can. Okay, I will start in the Q&A function. Anahi says, Sorry if I butcher anybody's names, first of all. Um, I just want to remind the presence of the house is actually a cultural institution called Rhizome. Also, could you define affordable? Yes, um, the house currently um, is commercially tenant with, tenanted with the Rhizome organization. And we have uh, been in contact with Lane and Rhizome and are approaching um, you know, a, a mutually acceptable uh, solution that keeps them within the neighborhood. Um, and the other question, I'm sorry, what was the other question? So I guess, I think to get at what the person is saying, you said, they said, could you define affordable? I guess, what are the best, like, uh, I think they're trying to figure out um, how you, how, what income levels uh, that folks will um, be at who are tenants in this project? Sure, sure. So. Um, just to reiterate, we, we, these units are intended for housing choice voucher program, um, voucher holders who are, it basically, they don't qualify. They wouldn't qualify for something like an IZ unit necessarily where they're not, um, you know, they're not at 30, 50, 80% AMI. Um, they're really historically the, the, um, the demographic most in need of housing and least able to pay for it. All right, Sarah, um, I think we answered, will it already be affordable housing? Is there any chance that it could end up not being affordable housing? That is not our business model. Again, you know, we have tried to get the housing authority to um, commit to an agreement with us that, um, you know, commits them and us to, you know, we asked for 15 years at least, and we still haven't gotten them to agree to anything yet. Um, but our, again, our, our business model, our uh, goal here, uh, all of our developments within the district are affordable of this nature. And we have our own management in-house management group uh, who specifically caters to affordable and housing choice voucher program tenants. Um, and you know, beyond an uh, official agreement, that, that's how we own and operate uh, all of our units within the district. Just a flag for people who are participating. If you 
post the same question twice in the chat and in the q and a i'm just going to go through them all i'll get to both places you don't have to repost it and i'll keep track of you in both places and everybody's question i'll ask everybody's questions as soon as i can get to them sarah asks is anyone concerned that there will only be houses and nothing for people to do uh, guess, well, go ahead I, I can i think i can answer that question if i understand it correctly um we have <clears throat> Excuse me. We incorporate um, meeting spaces and community gathering areas uh, within all of our new developments. Um, and we're starting to incorporate some programming as well as um, asking um, nonprofits to, uh, uh, I guess, occupy offices within our buildings as well as uh, provide programming for residents. So we do have um, community gathering spaces incorporated within the building. And in, in this situation as well, as Laura uh, showed, we have um, a green space, sort of a, a small park area behind the, um, the area that the house will be moved to. Um, and obviously we're in early stages yet, but you know we can get to the discussion of what exactly to include. We just showed some green space planting and some seating area here, but that can obviously be altered as well. Julia Moran Morton says, what AMI will you serve? Will you have a covenant file to commit this to affordable housing? What happens if it does not rent up to HCV holders? So again, this isn't, we, we don't, um, we are not the ones who decide who gets a housing choice voucher. Those are all, um, there's an enormous wait list for those, but the people who are, are uh, current voucher holders have qualified <clears throat> for those vouchers. Um, as I said before, the, these are historically the, the least able to uh, pay for housing, especially now in the district, uh, which is why we're providing this type of housing. Um, there has never been a shortage of um, housing choice voucher uh, holders. We have tenanted all of our properties quite quickly. Um, there is a large drive uh, from current uh, voucher holder residents to move out of some of the historically uh, less uh, well taken care of, let's call it um, uh, housing authority managed houses. I think the housing, housing authority currently has about $2 billion in deferred maintenance on their properties. <clears throat> some of which are being redeveloped as well, uh, forcing people to uh, find alternative housing. And we, uh, we provide that housing, we specifically target um, you know, higher income areas where there historically has been a lack of this type of housing. Jason, I might have addressed all of that, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I, I think you got through most of it. Jason Levitis asks, and I'll answer this one, has anyone thought about how this would fit if the MBT were growing up Maple here? I think that's still one of the options on the DDOT planning mats. Jason, DDOT has committed both publicly and to the commission that they're pursuing the Western alignment for the MBT now, which would not come up Maple Street then um, while it's still on some of the planning maps, um, it's our understanding that DDOT is pursuing the Western alignment at this time and it's engaging in land acquisition and things of that nature for that project. Um, Peter Weiss, who will own the Rhizome building being moved to the corner? I live on Maple and there's a house at 6917 that the owner said would become a single family home. Instead, he built a residence for development disabled people. I'm concerned that such a big house may not be rentable to someone who can only afford affordable housing and that someone like the 6917 developer might purchase it. So um, I can assure you that it won't be sold because it will be part of the building. Uh, in fact, the reason why we have to connect the new building with the old is because according to zoning, we can't have two separate structures on one lot um, and connecting them via that small glass hyphen um, is, is adequate uh, as far as zoning is concerned to qualify this as one structure. So it will, the entirety of the new building and the old house will remain under our ownership. We envision currently, again, this is somewhat early, but we envision currently that the house will remain as some sort of commercial space, which again, we would own. Okay. Um, a couple of these are just comments. Uh, they're not questions, so I'm gonna read them real quick. Actually, HCV can be issued up to 50% AMI, says Julia Moran Morton. 
Um, Nate says, although I understand the need for affordable housing, this would be a significant loss to DC's music, art, dance, and overall cultural community if Rhizome is displaced. Finding affordable locations for nonprofit artist run spaces is also a nece necessity in the city that I hope those city officials in attendance take note of. Uh, P. Griffin says, how large are the units? Um, I, I can answer that question. I just wanted to jump back to Rhizome. I know there are a lot of questions. I've been scrolling through the comments, a lot of questions, comments about Rhizome. Again, we are committed. We, we heard everyone's comments last time uh, in the smaller meeting about Rhizome. We are committed to helping them remain within the neighborhood and are um, working with Lane and the board to ensure that that happens regardless of what happens with this uh, building or, or, or anything related to it. So. Uh, Unit size, yep. Unit size, yes. Um, Laura, I'm not sure we have that. I think we have a unit count in here. Um, yeah, we don't have the overall size with the mix. Um, we can jump to a typical floor plan, which gives a general idea. Yes, OK. So, so we have a pretty even mix between um, one, two, and three bedrooms, a little bit higher in the one bedrooms. <laughs> um, average one bedroom is around 430, two bedrooms are around the 650 range, and then three bedrooms are generally around. Sorry, you broke up there on the square footage on the three bedroom. Oh, three bedrooms are around 900 square and feet. And so about a third, a third, a third, you said? Yep, it's a little heavier on the one bedrooms, um, but generally we're trying to find an even mix between the three unit types. Yeah, Laura, can you go back to that uh, that unit mix sheet so everyone can see that clearly? Yeah, so uh, obviously a strong uh, reaction to us uh, building these units um, and, and developing other properties of this nature in the city was the need for family sized units. So we, we tend to try to push um, further in the two to three bedroom range than certainly a lot of market rate units, but a lot of other affordable housing developments as well because of that, that great need. Julia Morin Morton, would Petra be willing to record a covenant that commits the housing to affordable in perpetuity? So we have not done that uh, yet. Um, I am not sure we would be able, honestly with, uh, financing through a bank, we would, they would be very interested in us doing that. Um, uh, we have, again, the, our, our greatest interest really is in reaching some sort of agreement with the housing authority or a related entity. And um, again, we, we have pushed that strongly um, and continue to push that. They're certainly a little backed up right now, particularly, but that is um, something that we would we would strongly pursue and have, have been pursuing. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had any resolution on that yet, but that's, that's where we have been trying to uh, push. We, <clears throat> they have quite a few residents who need these units, we know, because obviously we've built quite, quite a few units with uh, our tenants so far. Um, and we see that as, um, you know, really a potential valuable relationship for the housing authority in order to have um, units that they will know that for at least, you know, some period of time will be uh, dedicated to their uh, sole and exclusive use for these tenants. From Jay Hoffey, what is your obligation to help Rhizome stay operating in the community? As someone who's experienced DIY art and music community spaces being pushed out of the city by developers for the last 10 years, it's nice to hear you're offering this help, but I can't help but sort of being distrustful. Well, I can't share with you, we're, we're uh, speaking with Rhizome and I can't necessarily share exactly what our discussions with them have been until we reach some sort of an agreement, but uh, we are committed to reaching an agreement before anything happens with uh, the structure in order to let them remain within the neighborhood. Uh, we uh, have also discussed with them the fact that obviously the um, entitlement process, especially given that this is a historic property, uh, will take a little bit of time and we have committed to them that they will be certainly allowed to remain um, in the property until that happens. Um, and then obviously the, the agreement that we reach with them will, will govern 
Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, we have about two more minutes on these, Evan. Brenda, if we could kind of push through them. I didn't get to the chat yet, and I feel kind of bad to the folks that put their questions in the chat oh, rather okay. than the Q&A. Yeah. Um, from uh, P. Griffin, is the Wisconsin Avenue building also for voucher holders? Yes, it is. Okay. 400 square, Adele Dantzler says 400 square foot is quite small. Is this the average size for one bedroom units in the district? In the and probably smaller. Um, we, we, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what the average unit size is for market rate units as we don't build them. Um, but this is an average unit size for uh, the properties that we build. Um, I know that not having actual statistics in front of me, I know that the uh, historic trend in market rate units um, is, is pushing certainly this number and perhaps even lower. Um, I, I just don't have the exact statistics, so I can't. We're going to try and lightning round it here a little bit, so I'm going to push you a little bit on these. P. Okay. Griffin, from what I've heard, it's hard to get a housing voucher even for the working floor. If you don't fill up with voucher holders, will you adopt another affordable model? Um, we know that there are quite a few people on the wait list, uh, but we also know that there are quite a few people who uh, will need to be moved out of um, those units that I mentioned that have you know $2 billion in, in um deferred maintenance that the housing authority owns and moved into other uh, voucher housing units. We don't see any shortage in the near or even midterm future. As a neighbor in this area, will the parking at the shopping center with Big Bad Wolf be reduced? No, it will not. Will the existing house still be focused on arts in the community? Um, we are not sure other than the fact that we, we are fairly committed to having it remain as a commercial use, uh, which the, the location would tend to indicate that it would stay, maybe it's a you know, nonprofit use. It's, it's probably more office than retail. Um, we've considered using part of the space for our architectural studio as well, but we're, you know, it's, a, it's just a little bit early for us to know exactly what's gonna happen with that commercial space. What is historically significant about the house? So the house is a, according to, um, Historic Preservation Board in DC, the house is a contributing resource as a part of the Tacoma Park Historic District. Uh, and given that fact, they make that decision. We have nothing to do with that decision. Given that fact, uh, we've committed to keeping the house on the property. Comment, this old house is Rhizome DC, one of the most important community spaces in DC today. All right, Peter Weiss, uh, the placement of the house with no uplift off the ground, why do it that way? Um, I think I understand. Laura, I think we're just showing the house as, uh, I think we're just showing that green buffer and the house is actually. Um, yes, it is lifted. Yep, there are some steps coming up. Similar, this is similar to its existing condition. There's just some shrubs around that maybe kind of mask that. Google Maps from Adam Thomas, Google Maps suggests there's a zip car parked at this location. Will that spot be maintained? Um, as a part of our um, development program, we are committing to having car share spaces uh, in the building parking that will be accessible to the public. So that space where it is exactly right now will not necessarily remain there, but on the lot, there will be car share spaces. Okay, I think we answered the AMI question. I think we answered the guarantee to voucher recipients. Um, I think we answered the covenant question. Um, what will the unit, Vanessa Blanco, what will the units look like inside and will this building have accessibility for residents who need accommodations? Um, so what will the building look like inside? This will look like any other uh, new, uh, even market rate housing uh, development in the area. We, we do not cut corners. We do not develop things that you, one might traditionally associate with affordable housing. Uh, in the district. Um, we, I don't think we have a, you know, I don't have a photo prepared to show you, but I, if, if I had one, you would think that it was uh, certainly a, a mid, if not high end uh, market rate unit. Okay. Um, concerns, I think we've talked about what's going to happen with uh, uh, Rhizome. Oh, did you answer the accessibility question? Oh, no, I did not. Um, Laura, can you comment on that? I mean, I, I can say generally yes, but Laura can provide more. Yes, there's a there's an elevator um, 
in the building. So all floors are accessible and um, following building code, we would meet the, um, the accessible unit ratio that's required. So there would be 15% of the units would have accessible bathrooms and accessible kitchens. Henry Lohman uh, sent a long comment in support of Rhizome. Um, rather than read it aloud, I'm gonna drop it into the chat for everybody to see. Um, Jay Hoffey, is there a world where you see the existing building being used as a performance live music education space as it now is? Um, again, I, I think that we're a little bit advanced in terms of what we <clears throat> what we'll eventually and what that eventual use will be. I can tell you that live music connected to residential units is difficult, but I can't say, I, again, it's, it's just a little bit early for me to comment on exactly what that commercial space use will be. Uh, a long comment from Lewis Krauthammer. Um, I'm gonna take his comment rather than reading it aloud and drop it in the chat for everybody to see as well. Um, and then likewise for John Camp, um, Concerned Citizen says there were more two and three bedroom units in the proposal meeting last month. Is that accurate? I believe that's accurate. Laura can. Yes, that is accurate. Yes. In, in the changes that have been made from the previous meeting, we've pulled the building off of the property line to allow for more space of the sidewalk. We previously had pulled it closer up tight to the property line. And in doing so, it was very important for us to keep that same unit count, but some of the units had to shrink down. So a few of those two bedroom units became one bedroom units, which is why you can see we kept the three bedrooms knowing the family units are important, um, but some of those that were previously two bedrooms are now one bedroom units. Question, this is private bank financing, no LIHTC or CDFI type financing with affordable requirements. That is correct. And that allows us to, I think there was a question last time about <clears throat> the 218 Vine building uh, in relation to its financing and the delays that um, that caused and that extended project schedule. We do not uh, experience any of those related delays for that reason. Tom, I'm going to post your comment in the chat for everybody to see. Janelle, I think we answered that question. Joe Brennan, how long would the project take to complete and given development elsewhere on the street, how would construction affect the commu current community? So uh, construction usually, I mean, I can give you kind of a rough 12 month, uh, maybe 14 month process, but um, the, the rest of the buildings in this one block radius that are, are proposed and will be uh, built are mostly already approved, if not well on their way. So they're quite a bit ahead of us in terms of our entitlement process. Um, I would think there would be more of an issue in terms of the lot next to us and the building at 218 Vine being uh, built uh, simultaneously, but we envision kind of our building uh, coming online or starting construction and then coming online is sort of staggered after those other projects. Vanessa Blanco asks, your Fairmont apartments have a security guard. Will this also have that? Yes, we have security at all of our properties. It's not necessarily 24 hour security, but we do have on site management. Again, as I said, we have an in-house management team. So we have control all over all of those aspects. We do not outsource that. And again, we are long-term owners. Uh, so we are heavily invested in success, safety, security, and upkeep of all of our projects. Um, but yes, we will have security. We do have security at all of our properties. Debbie Winston, I'm gonna post your comment in the chat. Um, Peter Weiss, do I understand correctly that the building picture doesn't look like the actual building? Well, the image we see is only the shape of the building. That is exactly correct. And I mean, the, ven the fenestration patterns, the windows are, you know, we think fairly close to where they will wind up, but we want to present to everyone the massing of the structure with the understanding that we will obviously have further discussion with the ANC about how the building will look, but also historic preservation has kind of our, their, their sort of the final word on what they will approve. And uh, we, we have to go through that entire process uh, after we um, present to you and obviously go through a, a, another round of, of presentations for you all. Um, so they're kind of the, the gatekeeper, so to speak, on what the building will look like. So we're not, again, we're not building a big white building. Um, and I'm <laughs> sure that they wouldn't approve it anyway. Uh, this is just for massing purposes. That's the final question, Chair Parks. I'm going to post the comments that were sent to the panel in the chat now.
So commissioners, I, I guess if there's nothing else, um, I wanted to thank you all, thank all of the residents, thank all the participants for um, joining in, giving us your feedback. Uh, we certainly appreciate it and we try to take it into consideration and incorporate it into our designs. Um, we, again, I wanted to thank everyone. I, I said this last time, but I think it's worth repeating. <clears throat> I wanted to thank everyone for your enthusiasm about affordable housing. Um, I cannot tell you how many ANCs, different community groups we've presented to in various other neighborhoods that we work in that are basically give us the exact opposite feedback. Um, they do not want it. They do not want us building it there and they make it very difficult for us to do so. So I wanted to thank you all for that particularly. Um, and if there are any other questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Chair Parks, you're on mute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we're gonna move right along. Thank you. I'm not gonna repeat everything I just said to myself. <laughs> All right, reports, the Metropolitan Police. I did see uh, Captain. Okay. Yes, Captain Porter, hold on one second. It is 9.16. I'm going to ask everyone from here on, can we kind of speed up by talking a little bit? All right. Captain Porter's here. I'm so sure everyone can hear me. Um, Captain Franklin Porter, uh, 4th District. I'm going to go over the stats real quick for the last 30 days for the ANC on 4B. We did we did have one homicide happen on 8th Street in the 6200 block, happened back on the uh, beginning of October. Um, around 4.30 p.m., uh, one male lost his life in gunfire, um, almost like a drive-by. Uh, that's going to be the only homicide. Um, speaking of homicides, just want to make sure, I don't know if everyone is aware that the homicide in, in on Blair was closed by an arrest. It, it was posted on um, the listserv, but it was closed by an arrest of an adult male. Uh, so that, that homicide is closed, but the one on A Street right now is still open. We did have two assaults with a dangerous weapons, both gun violence. Um, the one on 200 block of Carroll Street, that one where um, a weapon was just produced and pointed at another individual. And we had another one in 6300 block of Kansas Avenue Northeast that happened on the 17th of October around two in the morning. And that one is by gun violence. Um, a vehicle came by, shot at a young male and he got hit twice in his leg. Uh, that case is still open. Now the problem what we've been having for the last 30 days, well, for like almost two months, we've been having robbery issues. Uh, we had six robberies in 30 days in, um, in ANC 4B. Uh, last year at this time, we only had one. So robberies are picking up. Um, they're picking up all over the city, uh, roughly around 3D, 5D, and 4D. Um, it's been robbery sprees. Uh, we just, matter of fact, we just worked in a carjacking um, before I came on the call over on Lausanne. Lazan. Um, so um, just be mindful that a lot of robberies are taking place. Like I said, we have to stick that as a lot of robberies. Um, going to the property crimes, property crimes, we had one burglary, um, theft of models, theft models are down. We only had 27 theft models last year at this time, we had 37. So theft models are down, thefts are down. We had 19 thefts last year at this time, we had 36. So that's, that's dramatically down. A lot of people are not going into stores anymore and uh, pretty much ordering stuff off of um, of Amazon. So the one thing that is up um, is motor vehicle thefts when it comes to property. There are there um, still that's basically our stolen autos. Uh, we had seven uh, last year. This time we had six. Uh, a lot of vehicles are getting stolen throughout the, the entire city, um, and probably seventy something percent of the vehicles getting stolen are um, are car deliveries. Basically, they deliver the um, food, they leave the vehicle running, and someone breaks. Um, dumps into it and takes it. So uh, we got to be mindful of that. What we've been doing is, if you leave your vehicle running and unattended, um, it's gonna it's gonna get you a citation because we're trying to uh, deter from that activity. Um, so um, so get the word out when when it comes to do not leave your vehicle running. Um, I know this cold starting to come in and people are gonna start warming their vehicles up and and leaving it run. Um, but if the officers see the vehicle running and no one's in it, they're gonna um, issue the ticket. Um, and I think that's it for the stats. Um, all right, that's it. I'm just opening up some questions. Commissioners, any questions? Yes. Um, Captain Porter, it's Perry Red uh, uh, for B05. Uh, I 
I heard your report and I heard the, the homicides. In my MC, there was a young man who was uh, killed on Friday night. And uh, the from the witnesses in that area on 8th and Jefferson, they tell me that he officers were had, were in conversation with him um, prior to. I met the young man about a week and a half ago. Um, and, and he was in conversation, and it was a heated conversation with some officers. And from what witnesses tell me, and, and their, their varying descriptions of what happened, but he was pursued by officers. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but what I do know is the young man is not with us. Uh, I just had a conversation uh, by text with the young man's father. Uh, he's dead now. Um, they took him off life support on Sunday. I didn't hear that in your report. Is there a, uh, actually I have three questions, but my first question is, is there a different form of, of, of uh, a, a death when you when you report the crime statistics, because I'm looking at the, the MPD website now, and I didn't hear that in your report. Officers were at the scene. So my second question is, how is it or why is it that we don't know? When I say we, I mean my constituents as well as myself. The family has questions about being notified taking two days to notify them only through a detective. And I guess my last, or, or, or my third question, because it's not my last, but do you have any knowledge of this, Captain Paul? And what is the location we're talking about? You said, is it, because only, the ASB 4B is the only homicide we had for the last 30 days is 6300 block of um, 8th Street. Are we talking about that homicide or are you talking about another shooting? No, sir. I'm not talking about shooting at all. This young man was okay. on a, one of the rebel scooters, um, the okay. mode of public transportation um, uh, yeah. that the city uh, allows to happen. And the young man was, uh, right. uh, and, and the, it culminated, from what I understand from the witnesses, it culminated in the area of 8th and Jefferson, 8th and, 8th and I want to say Longfellow, but between Jefferson and Kennedy. It, 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 you're talking about the the, the, the the vehicle accident that happened at um at um I think it, I believe it happened at Seventh and Kennedy. Is that ANC four B or four D? Four D. It's four D. Okay. Yeah, but that's it why, did that's come why. through my it, it did come through my my AMC. Right. And so yeah, that's, I, I mean I, that's why you don't hear it on my report because I, I usually stick to the ANC usually if I talk about that. But that particular case is investigated by what is called our major crash unit. They investigate when a vehicle accident. I think what happened with that one, he was trying to be stopped by police officers when he fled the fled the scene of the traffic stop, and subsequently mm -hmm. he did get hit by a vehicle. That 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 wouldn't be on my best my, my report on this one because, like I said, that did happen in ASD CD. But I but I was on um on the scene of that. That is a vehicle accident, and it's investigated by basically um, our um, major crash unit. But hey. also the um the aspect of what the officers were involved with. That is being investigated by our Internal Affairs Division. Is that right? And Captain Porter, just just to end that because you just made it clear that it was just outside of my MC. So so with that said, you were on the scene. Is it is it possible I can have a conversation with you offline? You can call my cell phone anytime you need to. Uh, do you have my cell phone number? I do. I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Always call my, my. I'm always available on on my cell phone. You can always call my cell phone. We can talk about anything you need to talk about. Thank you, Captain Ford. All right. I have one brief question. The fatal car accident that occurred at Piney Branch and Dahlia, um, I haven't gotten an update on whether there were ever charges filed in that case from the major crash unit. We're several months out now. So I was wondering if there were charges and if not, why not? Because supposedly the victim was a pedestrian in a crosswalk with the right of way when the accident occurred. Right. Okay. I might have to get back to you, Mr. Uh, Yates, on that one. I'm going to look into it. You said it was two months ago? Is it Piney Branch and Dahlia? I'd have to double check the date, but I can. Um... I, I'll find out. I'll research it tonight. I'm working tonight. So I'll research it tonight. 
and um, find out what was done with that. Um, a lot of times when um, when they do have charges on major crash scenes, sometimes they may not let me know. They may do <laughs> stuff, and it's already it's I, like major crash is not even in the fourth district. So it's once it goes outside our district, I really have to reach out to them and ask them, hey, what's going on with this case? And then they give me an update. I'd followed up with Captain Connors, I think a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago, when he was covering the for uh, that that portion of the. But he he said there hadn't been anything filed at the point, so this is just an attempt to follow up on that. Okay, I follow up on it. Um, As the commissioners, have I, I, have, I have a question. This is out. Okay, go ahead, sweetie. Um, Captain Porter, I have a resident who was on the on the call. Um, I don't know if he had to get up, but his car was stolen at the post office at North Capitol uh, Street and just over Kansas. I don't know what the other intersecting street is. But um, his concern is that um, MPD hasn't been um, sort of proactively looking for his vehicle. It was found by one of his friends, I believe, um, who were, they were out looking for the call. If um, Mr. Bryant is available, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, if Mr. Collins is available, if he could raise his hand so that Gordon could give him access so he could address this more specifically, I'd appreciate it because he was waiting to speak. But just in general, there have been several more car thefts in SMD 4B08 um, and 7, actually, because um, the post office is in 4B07. And I was just wondering if there's extra attention being paid to those areas. Where, where, whenever I do a, um, a crime stats and I figure out where most of the, the stolen vehicles are taking place, we definitely, I shoot it out to all my officers and let them know these are the locations we need to um, pay attention to. And what we do is we have these things called LPRs. There's license plate readers. Mm -hmm. We put the LPR vehicles that's equipped. Now, every vehicle doesn't have an LPR on it, but we do have like, I think about five vehicles that have LPRs on it, and we have put them around those area. Um, now, looking for a Pacific car, obviously, when a, we got like lots of cars that get stolen throughout the District of Columbia. So but what happens is ev almost every um, traffic um, light when you come through, when you have traffic cameras, the LPRs are equipped to those. So throughout the city, um, if any vehicle go by there that's that's reported stolen, um, um, that 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 would notify the officers and they take um, they take action on that. So that's basically how we look for stolen vehicles. We just wait for the LPR to, to, to hit up, or the officers drive around and they run tags. They just run tags. That, that's a lot of the way we um we get stolen vehicles. I used to work for the auto theft unit and I used to run tags all day just looking for stolen vehicles, looking for stolen vehicles. But that's how we do. But um, but I'm pretty sure that around that area, that's how we um we will put people around that uh, post office there to make sure. All right. Does that answer your question, Mr. Collins? You should be able to talk, sir. I'm not sure if he's still on. He <laughs> is. Okay. Uh, Bryant Collins, Brian Collins, you might be muted on your end. You should be unmuted here. His question in the chat, it was, uh, are, is uh, my car was stolen September 15th? Is there a number I can reach Captain Porter? Captain Porter, can you share a number that I can drop or an email that I can drop in the chat for people to reach out to you? That might solve that. That way people have access to it. Oh, yes. It, um, probably the best spot is my email. It's uh, Franklin, F-R-A-N-K-L-I-N dot Porter, P-O-R-T-E-R at DC dot gov. Um, if they like to call me, my cell phone number is 202-317-2050. I'm typing it in the chat for you, Evan. Commissioner Parks, we have uh, one hand raised from a constituent. I, I see one from Scott. Yeah, uh, just a quick question. How, uh, Captain Porter, how are you tonight? All right, good. Good, good, thank you. Um, just how effective are the LPRs one would one would think that the um, that criminals that that car thieves would swap out the license plates right away? Um, do you, do you do you get a lot of results from from the LPRs? Well, we definitely get a lot of results when it comes to uh, tagged uh, vehicles stolen. Um, almost every 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 day, uh, they get hit on vehicles. But you're you're definitely right when uh, when vehicles are being stolen what they do is they quickly try to find another tag and take the tag and um, swap it out. Um, so we, we, what we do is as soon as we, 
we reported the vehicle stolen, we try to get it in that LPR as fast as possible. But because uh, before they start switching them, but uh, but most of the vehicles that get stolen, they're used in robberies, used in shootings, and um and and they obviously don't don't want to keep that same tag on there to um slow us down a little bit. But um but we we have made arrests in cases with the LPRs. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank Evans. You. Yep. Janet McCormick wants to know, are robberies and carjackings occurring during the daytime, evening, or night? A lot of them, a lot of them happen at 4 a.m., around the a.m. time, uh, when people are going to work, not, not many people on the streets, not many witnesses. Uh, what, we, what we've been getting hit is the, uh, a lot of um, uh, Spanish-speaking uh, citizens, um, especially during the 4 a.m., between 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. It's, it's a lot of robbery streets goes around, and they look for uh, probably a single Latino male walking to uh, the Metro bus, probably on his way to work. They hit them real quick. Um, a lot of times they take their cell phones, so it basically shorten the times that we're going to get calls. So we have they have to find a phone to basically call us. Um, the good thing has been we can track some of the phones, but they've been um, keeping the phones off or taking the SIM cards out. So it's a lot of stuff that we got to do. But just what a, if if you out. In the morning, walking to work or standing by the metro, be mindful of your surroundings. Don't walk alone. Um, that's what we've been trying to tell a lot of people, especially the Latino um, community. Uh, we've been putting that out to basically make sure they do not walk alone because that's where they're getting hit. They're getting hit by somebody that's sitting at the metro by themselves. Okay. Peter Weiss, what is the definition of a robbery? Is it person to person? Does it mean there's a big break into a harm home? Does it involve a weapon? No, uh, when somebody when somebody go inside of a residence, that's a burglary. Um, it's 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 it, it's when you get robbed inside your home, that's technically a burglary. We call it a burglary. A robbery has to be a person to person outside. Um, so say you're walking, a person comes up to you and snatch something out of your hand, that's a robbery. Let's say you drop your your cell phone on the ground and somebody comes and grabs it and and runs from you, that's a theft. So it has to be a person to person. He has to literally almost come in contact with that person taking their property from them. Final con con comment we're seeing is from Brian Collins. He says he's got his numbers. Thank you. I would like to add about the LPR when I went to recover my car. The officer who came had an LPR and stated how it worked, but said his was turned off. I'm not sure. Maybe I don't know if it was malfunctioning at the time or something. Sometimes they do malfunction, just like any computer. They will, um, they will malfunction, but um, most of our LPRs are very good. Chair Parks, I see no more questions in the chat. All right, thank you. Thank you, Captain Porter. Have a thank good, you. safe evening. Thank okay, you. next is uh, Brandon Todd's office. Council Member Brandon Todd. Go ahead. Hi. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you can. Okay. Are we on video or no? Uh, come on, Dolly. You. <laughs> Two and a half hours in, are we on video? Yes. We are no, on video, this, but you are not, Dolly. She should be able to activate her video in one second. Okay, Dolly, we're gonna cut you. Go ahead. You're muted. Good evening, everyone. Uh, on Wednesday, um, this coming Wednesday, there's going to be a ribbon cutting for the Tacoma Park Dog Park. Uh, Shepherd Elementary School ribbon cutting on the new gym and cafeteria will be in the next few weeks. On Friday at 1 p.m., there will be a ribbon cutting for the new development rigs place at EYA. Uh, in terms of legislation, uh, we're very happy to announce <coughs> the first vote this week on Councilmember Todd's addressing dyslexia and other reading disabilities. 15 to 20 percent of the population suffers from some form of dyslexia, according to the International Dyslexia Association. The new legislation that is supported unanimously by uh, Chairman Mendelson and, Chair, and uh, Committee uh, Chair Grosso's office, who have all worked in tandem with Council Member Todd, is probably the most significant reading and literacy legislation initiative in the District of Columbia in probably 20 or 30 years. 
This particular legislation will provide for kindergarten through second grade assessments. It will provide for remediation, teacher training so that they can identify dyslexia and other reading disabilities, as well as an accountability program where OSSI will have to, well, the LEAs will have to report to OSSI on uh, the um, assessments provided for all the students and their remediation plans. We anticipate that this legislation will be finalized by the end of the year. Uh, there is a new excavation underway at uh, Walter Reed. Uh, in addition, uh, the Government Operations uh, Committee um, is hosting a hearing tomorrow on uh, the Fair Tenant Act. Uh, last week, there was a hearing uh, based on Councilmember Todd's work for public workers' disability uh, and claims that's probably the most significant changes that have been underway. Many district employees who have been hurt or harmed on the job um, have not necessarily received their disability and comp in compensation and what would be considered fair, this legislation will bring uh, 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 the district up to date. Um, do we have any questions this evening? Chair Parks, I have a question. And I see a couple in the chat. Um, yes, go yeah. ahead. I, yeah, I wanted to ask uh, Dolly um, really briefly about DCPS's plans for reopening. There was a committee of the whole hearing on Friday, and I noted that Councilmember Todd was absent. So I wanted to ask what his engagement has been on this issue and what's his opinion on DCPS's plans for reopening. I'm sure, you know, ironically that you mentioned that. Uh, as you may or may not know, Evan, Councilmember Todd has been a pretty, uh, I would say that he is probably one of the best council members when it comes to evaluating what's going on in DC schools. Just this evening, I received a checklist. Uh, we call it a punch list. The punch list uh, provides an overview of what's going to take place at every single DCPS school to make the school ready for the school year. Uh, I think we have a list of about 30 items or so. Um, so that's what his engagement and his focus is in terms of opening schools. We will be touring some of the schools to make sure that the repairs that were needed are in place. This is something that we have been working with, uh, that we've worked with every year for the past five years uh, that we've done with working with DGS and uh, DCPS. And we will, also be, uh, ha we will also be speaking with the charter schools before the schools open. So I guess I wasn't- It's been a customary practice. So I guess I'm not asking about facilities. Um... You know, as a parent, facilities make a difference, Evan. The reason why facilities are important is because when your child goes back to school, you want to make sure that there is a plan in place for cleaning. What are going to be the protocols? Have all of the leaking roofs been repaired? Do the water fountains work? Do the bathrooms work? Um, he has probably done more for Ward 4. And, you know, here's what I want to say, Evan. Don't come for me tonight. Okay. Not in the mood. You are consistently disrespectful. And what I want to say to you is that Council Member Todd is in touch with the Chancellor on a regular basis. And you know as well as I do that Council Member Todd cares about the residents, he cares about the school, and that's why he has made nearly three quarters of a billion dollar investment so that your child has a better place to go to school. So don't nitpick me tonight. Not in the mood. Do not do it. Wow. Be respectful. <laughs> Okay, okay. You I, 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 hold on a minute. I don't know what the problem is tonight. I know Halloween is coming up, you know, so, you know, everybody, let's respect each, each other here, regardless whether we are commissioners or whoever you are, whoever you work with, let's have respect, okay? Let's have respect. Because if we can't have respect, go ahead and cut it. Thank uh, you. Yes, ma'am. So I don't deny the importance of facilities. I just have heard from a lot of families in my community that they're concerned about um, class sizes, about the impact on teachers in middle and high schools um, being pulled away from their duties attending to those students and being put into elementary school, about the possibility of virtual classrooms having up to 40 kids in them. Like there's lots of other questions outstanding. 
And since Councilmember Todd wasn't at the hearing, I don't know how he feels about it. And neither does any do any of the families that I represent. So I, that's what I wanted to know. And I'm, I open the door for you to say, you know, whatever you want to say in the most respectful way possible. Great. Uh, you know what? I will make sure that we have a comment about it in this week's newsletter. I'll what I do, to. what I do know is that um, he. What I can tell you that I know about him for the past five years is that he has been consistently concerned about the health and the welfare of every single student in the District of Columbia, particularly Ward Four. Um, so if there's some very specific questions that you have about, please email me and I will get responses to your questions. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You insult the council member, you insult me. Don't do it again, Evan. I don't believe I said anything insulting. Probably. Okay, okay. Miss okay. Turner, you've uh, gone way past your time. We're going to... Uh, Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat I can read. From Julia. Oh. Uh, we have a commission. Commissioner Red still has a question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that exchange I'm, I'm wondering about, and for the record, I'm against reopening at this time. Dolly, let me ask you about the project on Shepherd. You've been very, um, you were uh, uh, helpful in just opening the door that we could find out what that is. My constituents still don't know the ones on Madison um, oh. and, and their, pro their property abuts that, that project with the big hole in the ground. Uh, nothing's been put there yet, but they okay. cleared it all. And where, where is it again, Commissioner? It's, yes, it's between, it's the, between the, the 600, it's in the 600 block, six, 700 block of Shepherd Road. It's Thank actually you. an alley with a street sign on it, but Shepherd Road. And, and it's between Longfellow and Madison. Um, mm -hmm. I sent you the, the map of it and the coordinates for it. And, uh, but the workers on the, on the project, they can't tell me who's, uh, who, who's the foreman, uh, who, who's the developer on it. And I still don't know who it is and the constituents are asking me. So can we get, yes. uh, get back to that maybe? Yeah, no okay, problem. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. No, thank you. Thank you, Dolly. Okay, thank you, Dolly, so much. Have a safe evening. You too, thank you. Okay. Um, Mayor office? You should be, uh, be able to talk, Mokers. Hello, everybody, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, I'm going to uh, try to keep my updates brief. I know it's been a lengthy meeting, uh, but just a few updates for you from the mayor's office. Beginning last Tuesday, D.C. residents with an iPhone or an Android will begin receiving uh, push notifications, inviting you all to join into our exposure notifications. Uh, and the sole purpose of this app is to uh, help stop and slow the spread of COVID-19. And once uh, the pandemic reaches a point that is no longer necessary, the app will automatically be disabled. Uh, and you may choose to share your information or you may choose not to. Um, and the system will still notify you if you've come in contact with someone who has tested positive. I want to thank Commissioner Palmer for her uh, efforts with making sure our residents are informed about voting. Uh, early voting starts tomorrow from 8.30 a.m. to 7 p.m all the way to November 2nd. And right here in Ward 4, our early vote centers are Lafayette Elementary School, Shepherd Elementary School, Ida B. Wells Middle School, Raymond Recreation Center, and Emory Heights uh, Recreation Center. Uh, Halloween is right around the corner. Uh, I just want to remind everyone to keep those uh, gatherings below 50 and that Halloween costume masks do not uh, take the place for those uh, cloth coverings or the medical masks. Uh, on October 13th, DPR opened up 29 recreation centers and six aquatic centers uh, for fall programming. Uh, so residents that are interested in, in, in taking part in it, whether it's swimming at, at Tacoma, 
or doing some type of recreational activity, please visit dpr.dc.gov to do a fall programming reservation. Uh, beginning on November 9th, DPW will kick off leaf collections. Uh, due to the pandemic, each household, aka collection spot, uh, where DPW picks up trash and recycling, will receive 20 bags beginning on October 30th. And then the leaf collections will begin on November 9th. Uh, you can download the DCDPW app on your phone, which will provide you the schedule, or you can just visit dpw.dc.gov. Uh, the district has partnered with CVS and Walgreens to provide flu shots uh, at our public COVID test sites. Uh, residents must be 12 years and up. Uh, so we invite you to make sure you get your flu shot, uh, your flu vaccination, especially as we go into the cooler months. Uh, I want to thank Commissioner Tiffany Johnson and Scott Knickerbocker for their uh, continued advocacy. The Coolidge track has been reopened to the public. Uh, and then as, as uh, Ms. Turner mentioned earlier, uh, on Wednesday, we will have the Tacoma Park Dog Park uh, ribbon cutting and we are we have invited the commissioners but we are keeping uh, the crowd limited due to the pandemic but once the project is finished we invite all neighbors to bring their furry friends over and that is all the oh and move DC I'm sorry um, Move DC is the state transportation plan that the District Department of Transportation is required to update every five years, looking ahead 25 years. Uh, this plan will set a vision for managing how we get around the district, whether by car, public transportation, active transportation like biking and walking, or even freight delivery. DDOT has already released a draft set of strategies and policies and an equity statement, uh, but they want public input, uh, both on the drafts presented and also concerns that individual residents, businesses, and stakeholders are aware of, but not might not be included. Uh, so the key website to visit is wemovedc.org, wemovedc.org. And DDOT will be holding uh, public town halls on October 27th, and October 28th. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, sir. Commissioner's questions. Scott? Just, just quickly, I wanna I wanna say that Tiffany deserves all the credit for the Coolidge track. So that's that's her. Very good. Thank you, Tiffany. There's a question in the chat. I, I have hold on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Did I understand you say that uh, each household is going to get 20 bags for leaves, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, question is, mm -hmm. every household in the District of Columbia pay taxes. And if the workers wear a mask mm -hmm. and they are outside, why is it everything is put on the pandemic right now that anything in the city basically can't get done. But if you're outside with the mask, why the leads cannot be picked up by P uh, DPW? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question, Commissioner. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, I, because and, I mean, I'm, I'm tired of uh, everything is putting on the pandemic, the pandemic, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. No, we mm -hmm. got to look at this thing logically, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you raise a fair point. I know we, um, right now, DPW is short staffed. Um, and hopefully uh, before leaf season comes to a conclusion, we won't experience a snow emergency event uh, because then that will also push back our trash collection and our, our, our leaf collection. Uh, so that's something that I'll bring back to the team because I know a few residents have brought up that concern. Um, but if you are a resident that is enrolled in our hardship collection program, then DPW will work with you um, about collecting of those, those leaves. But I, I will definitely take that back to the team. I, okay, thank you. I'll talk to you later about that. Uh, yes, ma'am. Sweetheart. Can you expand on what the hardship program is? The hardship program is if you are uh, someone who needs assistance with having your, your trash picked up. So uh, mm -hmm. you, you usually have a... a um, like senior citizens. Yeah, like senior citizens or uh, residents yeah. who are... are uh, See, I don't like using handicap. I like using handicapable. Uh, so let's. Uh, so our residents who are experiencing some challenges, those are, that are enrolled in that pro program. And if you would like to be enrolled in that program, I can definitely help you uh, with that. My uh, cell number is 202-436-2087, or you can shoot me an email 
at keyshawn.harris.dc.gov, at dc.gov, excuse me. Okay, anything else? Uh, Evans, any more commissioners? I'm sorry. I, this is Commissioner Brooks. I had a question and or comment. Um, <clears throat> as I think some residents are aware, we have an Eagle Scout project going on. So um, uh, both Julie Lawson and Keyshawn have been instrumental in helping us gather the necessary um, items for the cleanup this weekend. But um, Mr. Harris, it would be wonderful if we could get the grass cut at the median at New, Ham New Hampshire and North Capitol because it's not being cut on a regular basis. I will let DPW know. I, I think they did one side, but they didn't do the other side. So I, I'll follow up with them. Thank you. Correct. So thank you. And we'll be planting this weekend. So if they could somehow Good. squeeze that in, that would be great. Okay. Okay, um, Evan. Chair Parks, the Vanessa Blanco wants to know, the pool was open at Tacoma. Will the fitness center open soon? I'm not sure, but let me follow up. If you want to ping me on this side, then I can get you an answer. Okay. And then, uh, um, Kishan, I will drop your contact information in the chat. Um, Adele Dantzler would like to be recognized for a question about DCRA. Gordon, can you do that? They didn't actually put the question in there. Didn't hear you, Evan. Yep. Adele, you're, you're on. All right. Thank you. Um, I had a question about who I would contact uh, it, about illegal construction. Um, ne right next door, they're planning on putting a large uh, addition that I found out that it's going to go three feet back. Uh, and they do have a postcard, a postcard uh, permit, but it only uh, that only allows for interior work. They've already destroyed or they've already demolished. Uh, a large deck, which they did not have a permit to do, and they plan on going three feet back uh, and, you know, farther than the, where the deck was, as well as they plan on digging two feet down, um, you know, in the basement, which would actually disrupt the water table. So they have a postcard permit when uh, other neighbors have, when another neighbor have asked them, they said, oh, we have all the permits we need. And well, we did, I did make an illegal uh, construction uh, complaint on Friday, and I know Commissioner Palmer followed up as well. Mm -hmm. I have not received any any um, information back from DCRA, so I just wanted to know who I would contact in order to get uh, because this is they're going to build they're going to they're going to uh, build immediately. I know they are, mm -hmm. and um, I wanted and once it's built, there's nothing we can do. Gotcha. Well, hello. Nice to meet you virtually. Uh, you. <laughs> I'm that second step after you've reached out to uh, 311 and, or the agency directly and they aren't responsive to you. Um, so I'll speak with Commissioner Palmer about it on the side to get that address and then we'll see what, what DCRA says. Okay, Ms. Dantzler? All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Thank you, Adele, for raising that and Keyshawn, I'll get in touch with you. All right. Next question from the chat. Any thought on requiring bike riders to pass some type of test to ensure they know the traffic rules and tags to identify bikes since they are sharing the road in large numbers and often running lights and stop signs? Sean? <laughs> so I would take that suggestion and definitely suggest it to our Move DC team. Uh, their town halls are, are October 27th from 10 to 11, and then October 28th from, let's see, it is. 7 to 8 p.m. Janelle, it says, thank you for the local and small business COVID-19 assistance grants. Adam Thomas says, is the new dog park southwest of the aquatic center? Have the drainage issues been resolved? There are massive puddles that block the sidewalk there. So it is going to be on the side closest to 5th Street. It's, it's, it's kind of awkward. It's between 5th and Van Buren uh, on the side closer to Coolidge, the uh, Frank Williams Activity Center. Um, and I think a whole part of the encompassing project will include the drainage. If not, I will ask uh, DGS and DPR to get back with us uh, on an update on that. But thank you for raising that. Chair Parks, the chat is clear of questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, uh, Kishan. Okay. Frazier Aliri, you ready? You should be on, Frazier. I'm ready. Good evening, everyone. 
Good evening. I uh, the schools will be open uh, supposedly on the 9th of November for pre-K through fifth grade, all of the elementary schools. Um, the most of the people on the state board of education through our last couple of meetings. Uh, we've had over 100 people testify that they didn't think the school should be reopened until they're safe. Uh, supposedly, this week and next week, there are going to be inspections in all of the elementary schools <clears throat> in the city uh, with uh, members from the school community uh, allowed to go into the buildings and check out to make sure that the buildings are safe. Uh, you need to raise your voice to make sure that you're part of that or that you know someone that's part of that in the school that you are uh, servicing. As it was mentioned, the secondary uh, teachers and staff, not the teachers, the secondary staff from the high schools and the middle schools have been uh, designated certain people uh, to work in the elementary schools once they're opened as uh, support personnel in the care classrooms, which are the classrooms where the students will come to the school and they will be doing virtual learning inside of the school rather than at home. And those are students whose parents have been notified uh, starting last Friday, hopefully, uh, to let them know whether they qualify for that. Um, the communication between the school leadership and that's the mayor and the chancellor uh, towards the parents and the teachers and the principals has been uh, deficient. The only time people find out about what's going on with the schools is at the mayor's press conferences. Uh, the way that they are communicating with the parents to let them know that their students are gonna be a part of the classrooms uh, because not all students are going, not all elementary school students are going, <clears throat> is through emails. And one of the biggest problems we've had with virtual learning is that there are many students who don't have uh, internet connection. And you can put that together yourself. Um, we'll find out about the schools. I've been invited to a couple of schools already uh, to go uh, do a walkthrough with that a checklist that Dolly was talking about to make sure that schools are safe. Uh, but, but there really needs to be a community, um, I won't say an outcry, but a, a lift of the voice to find out exactly what's going to happen when the, on the first day of school when they open, uh, because we've gotten really mixed messages from the chancellor about uh, testing, about temperature taking, about PPE, about all that. And since they won't let anybody into the buildings yet, we don't know what they look like. Um, the good news is the book drive that uh, we began in March. Uh, we've, we've been able to um, deliver over 12,000 books to the elementary <clears throat> uh, and uh, Ida B. Wells, Roosevelt and Coolidge um, in the last uh, however many months that is, six or seven uh, months. And uh, we're starting to collect books again. I still uh, got my back porch empty, but my front, my living room is still packed with books. And if you've got some books in your house, just please get in touch with me. I put my information in the chat room, uh, my email and my phone number and um, I still deliver it, uh, the books to the food sites twice a week. And every two weeks, uh, we've been delivering books to all of the elementary schools in DCPS in Ward 4. <clears throat> and um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a different plan since the elementary schools are opening about getting the books there. But as soon, as long as we have books, we'll deliver them. Thank you. Any questions? Commissioners? Uh, Frazier. Yes, ma'am. You said in the next two weeks that uh, you will be going around to the different schools to see if the water and everything is working. Schools have been closed for eight months now. 
I, yeah. I, I, it boggles my mind for us to even have to, for the should, there shouldn't even be any kind of uh, inspections done because the custodians have been there. People have been in all of the school buildings since they were closed. And yeah, uh, there why? should be inspection done. Yes, it should be. Uh, I'm going to tell you the reason why. School's been closed for eight months. You just begin it to go in in the next two weeks. Uh, and school opened on November 9th. If uh, everything in the schools, the running water, the bathrooms, uh, the heating system, because it's, it's getting cold, heat have to come on. And if the ventilation have not been cleaned and these kids have to go into the schools, what are you all going to do about it? When you say you all, you're talking about the State Board of Education? Yes. And okay. aren't, aren't you on the education board? Yes, I am. Okay. Here's the, here's the, here's the answer to that question because yes, we got that at our last <clears throat> board meeting because yeah. a lot of people said well y'all need to get out there and stop that from happening and we don't have because of the way that the state board of education is set up right now mm -hmm. uh and when when mayor fenty took over and gave and took over the power of being in charge of the schools and the mayor is in charge yeah. of the schools yep. the state board of education doesn't have anything to do with that that's mm -hmm. the that's the worst thing all right. Oh, we weren't even right. we, weren't, right. we weren't even asked to be a part of the mayor's reopen committee. Mm. The mayor's reopen education committee did not even have a member from the state board of education. And uh, so that's what okay, uh, that's what I'm going to be doing uh, if I'm elected in, in two weeks. And if I'm not, then I'm a really bad candidate since. Uh, no, you've been, not, you've been really good. You're not bad. You've been good. No, I'm just saying I'm not running against anybody. So uh, <laughs> you better get elected. <laughs> but if but, you don't but, get elected, it's on you. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I think, but I'm yeah, against me. I'm against mayoral control. I think that there should be more control of the community, and um, that's what I'm going to be working on uh, because I, I think it's a. I, I'm I'm really worried about the schools opening. Because well, I'm, they're I'm trying to rush yeah. the schools opening, yeah. And then, what happens if if a child gets sick and passes away? Well, and that, and that, that's I, when I you go to, to the school board and look at the school board and you tell them, yeah, yeah. you well, killed I, oh, my look, child. Please, please watch our every meeting, and you will hear me saying that all the time. You know, right? um, I, 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 I. I I'm in prayer with these kids going back to school. I am too. Um, because I'm afraid because uh, these kids have not been tested. Uh, and 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 I'm not gonna have to say this. I even though the custodians may have been in the building all these eight months, uh, but who was in there checking saying that these buildings are clean? Um, well, anyway, I'm, I'm going to, that's a sore thumb of mine and I'm going to leave it alone. Thank you so much. No, no, no. <laughs> Don't leave it alone. <laughs> no, I'm going to leave it alone right. for tonight because it's after 10 o'clock and we have to go home. So even though we are oh, home. Oh, I'm home. Questions, <laughs> questions from the chat, Chair Parks. Um, first of all, Janelle wants to know, is DCHA providing internet service for homes with school age kids? Say it again. I'm sorry. Is DCHA providing internet service for homes with school age kids? Uh, if that's in reference to the housing authority for in terms of public housing, they are not. That's something that we asked for in our municipal internet resolution that the city consider expanding municipal internet and starting with public housing. So they, the, the, the system yeah. says that every child who Ask for a computer has one. Right. All right. Now you can believe that if you want to. I don't believe. I don't believe it at all. Okay. All right. um, um, check with uh, Comcast because I know uh, in first beginning Comcast was giving uh, people hot our children hotspot. Right. Yes. So, in yeah. the district. So check with yeah. Comcast. Right. Um, but, um, but the thing them. about the thing about the hotspots is you have to have a a computer with an internet connection for a hotspot to work. And uh, from what we've, what we've heard from the teachers, especially from the teachers, is that a lot of the students don't have that kind of connection. 
Okay. Okay. So also, also in the chat real quick, Frazier, can you drop your contact information in the chat again? I think it got lost in the history. And now that okay. you're a panelist, you can send it out to every attendee rather than the panelists. Oh, sure. And then, um, please, the Whittier PTA president would like you to know that, uh, um, oh, Allison took care of it for you. Whittier PTA president would like you to know that she's willing to help with book distribution at Whittier, so you can contact her for that. Um, okay, just have her get in touch with me. Yep. And I'm putting uh, it in right now. I, I uh, Allison already did it for you. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I saw it right as you were. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. thank you, Allison. And then... Um, <laughs> Comments, I will just take and drop into the all panelists and attendees rather than reading aloud. And then, um, uh, and I'll ask uh, uh, Ms. Turner if she's still on board to answer the question that just came in for her. I'll drop that in the chat as well for her to respond to. And I'll, I'll elevate her answer if there is one as well. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Any more, Evan? No, all the rest of them are comments and I'm gonna put them in the chat. All right, thank you. Going to the consent calendar. Um, um, one second in the chat, uh, Dolly just asked, what is the question? I just put it in the group chat. So that, there. Yep, okay, it's all in right. there now. And if Dolly responds, I'll make sure that it gets put out to everybody. That's okay. We're going to move on. Consent calendar is after 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Okay. Resolution. Uh, this is a consent calendar at 2467. Consent calendars here. And number one is resolution 4B201001, supporting proposed capital bike share stations at Kansas Avenue and Longfellow Street Northwest. That was Commissioner Johnson. Resolution 4B201002, encouraging best practice to assure broad, inclusive, and robust participation in DC government hearing. And that's Commissioner Palmer and Commissioner Johnson. Letter to the District of Transportation regarding improvements of traffic safety, safety assessment process. And that's Commissioner Palmer and Commissioner Yates. Letter to the District Department of Transportation requesting traffic safety improvements on Butternut Street Northwest, Commissioner Palmer and Commissioner Yates. Resolution 4B201003, requesting installation of speed humps on 6th Street Northeast from Eastern Avenue Northeast to Oneida Street Northeast, Commissioner Brooks. Resolution 4B201004, requesting traffic calming, calming for the 5700 through the 5900 blocks of Eastern Avenue Northeast, Commissioner Huff. Resolution 4B201005, requesting installation of speed hum on Delia Street <clears throat> Northwest between Georgia Avenue Northwest and Piney Branch Road Northwest, Commissioner Yates. I have just read all seven resolutions. Motion. I move to approve the consent calendar as presented. Second. It has been approved, not approved, yeah, approved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? If I nay, we have to go through all of them, correct? Right, but you do. We're not gonna have no nays. <laughs> We're going home. Okay. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. I just I respect my. All right, it's all. All right. all right, thank, thank, thank you, Mr. You. Perry. All approved. Resolution number nine, resolution four B twenty zero zero six, establishing a Vision Zero committee, and that's Commissioner Yakes and Commissioner Brooks. Uh, three minute presentation. I'm going to give you a minute and a half. Commissioner Brooks, do you want to go first or shall I? You shall. You go. <laughs> really briefly, as you have seen over our agenda over the last few months, uh, the commission has spent a long time um, passing resolutions and speaking to the issue of 
uh, safety for our communities and for road users of all types um, in our communities. Um, these are goals that if you read the, the resolution uh, is are shared by the council and by the mayor and in furtherance of those goals, we are asking the commission to form a vision zero committee to improve that work, to improve the outreach on that work and to improve uh, to give more people a voice on it. If it passes tonight, it will have seven committee members be co-chaired by Commissioner Brooks and myself, and we will recruit people from throughout the 4B community in order to fill those seats. Commissioner Brooks? You said it all. There we go. Questions? And Commissioner's questions? I just want to say I'm excited for this committee because the commission as a whole has put in a lot of work on these types of issues and it will be great to have some more focus and dedication to it. So thank you both. Anyone else? Have anyone on chat? I'm not seeing anyone. Okay, so let's vote. I'll um, make the motion. I'll make the second. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Nays? Okay, ayes have it. Resolution 4B201007, supporting and providing recommendations on B23-149, Fair Tenant Screaming Act of 2019, B23-498, Intercessional Discrimination Protection Amendment Act of 2019, and that's B23-195, Michael A. Stutz, Anti-Discrimination Amendment Act of 2019. Thank you, Commissioner Parker. Thank you for reading that long resolution title. Um, this is a resolution in support of three pieces of proposed legislation that are before the DC Council coming up for a hearing before the Committee on Government Operations. And as Commissioner Parks mentioned, they are the Fair Tenants Screening Act of 2019, the Intersectional Discrimination Protection Amendment Act of 2019, and the Michael A. Stoops Anti-Discrimination Amendment Act of 2019. These pieces of legislation prohibit housing providers from inquiring as to a prospective tenant's credit history, among a few other things, where the tenant is rest renting with the assistance of a housing voucher, as well as includes individuals experiencing homelessness as one of the protected classes in anti-discrimination -discrimin legislation. Um, while we currently have the Human Rights Act of 1977, which protects individuals from discrimination based on a number of distinct traits, including things like race, sex, and political affiliation, a lot of the things that we're pretty familiar with, the law does not specifically protect individuals experiencing homelessness. So this adds those individuals to the list of protected classes. And I think supporting this legislation is in furtherance of the work that our commission has done in support of the concept of housing as a human right um, and to limit and encourage consequences for discrimination against individuals who rely on subsidies or who are experiencing homelessness and seeking housing. So that's what I have. Okay, questions, commissioners? I think I wanna thank Commissioner Palmer for bringing this forward. Um, you've worked very hard and our commission has uniformly supported your efforts um, to expand access to affordable housing in our community. And I think uh, that this is uh, another step in that direction. And I appreciate you uh, taking the time to put this resolution forward. And I wanna second that. Thank you very much, Aaron. Yes. Uh, anyone on chat about this, Evan? Negative, Chair Parks. I think we've right. tired everyone out at this point. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I wanted to say, I'm just going to be just for a second. I uh, thank everyone, especially the commissioners, all of those that have worked so hard. And um, and I know it was a long agenda tonight, but it was a it was Brenda, agenda. Brenda, we still have to vote on this one, though. Oh, wow. Why do I always forget about vote? It's passed. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> 
All right. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Please I'll move the resolution so that okay. we can, Please we can do. close off debate. I'll, I'll make it. a motion. Second it. Second. All in favor? Aye. We. Aye. See how easy that was? Okay. I want to thank all of you all because this agenda was very long tonight. And I want to thank the 32 members that uh, stayed with us. We started out with 75, we're down to 32, and I want to thank those because we know it was long, but this was something that we had to discuss that had to be done before the first of the year, and we only meet next month. We do not meet in the month of December. Aaron and uh, Evan do not come up with no quick meeting. We're not meeting in December. I need a break. Okay, I know we have, I know we broke in early the year, but I need a break. Hey, Brenda. What day do we do it? Uh, do we meet on the regular time next month because of the holiday or? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. It's Thanksgiving week, but it's that Monday. It's that Monday. Okay. And uh, since everybody has, you know, telephones now, I know a lot of people may go visit their family for that week, but log in, you know, from your yeah. iPhones or, you know, whatever you may have. But I do want to thank all of y'all. You have done a wonderful job. And uh, with that note, I'm going to ask that we all, that's the 32 and plus all the commissioner that's left, and school open November the 9th. Let's go in prayer with our, for our children and for our teachers and for our parents because we're going to need it, okay? And those for people that have kids and people that don't have kids, pray okay. for our children, pray for our children because those are supposed to be our future and we don't want anything to happen to them, okay? So with that note, will someone uh, say we adjourn? And I'm seconding. Motion to adjourn this meeting in October of 2020. We're not taking any community concerns? Or just on We're required, we have to do the community concerns. It's legally required. <laughs> we have to do it. Yeah. Community concern it. is not legal, but community concerns. No. Please raise your hand right now. <laughs> Julie, Julie, uh, she said that she we would see her in an hour, and so here she is. Oh, <laughs> there you go, Judy. <laughs> I wanted to give you all one more chance for the bat wings, um, but um, I did want to speak in my um, Whittier PTA hat. Um, thank you so much to Fraser for speaking about the need for our custodians and their work. I wanted to mention on a positive note, um, we are going to have a character parade at Whittier on Saturday, starting at three o'clock. If you wanted to come out around the block of the school and see all of our kiddos in their costumes, um, we'll be having music and candy and Kula just donated pumpkins for us um, for the kiddos to have some time with their friends. I did also want to have a moment of recognition. We lost our custodial foreman on October 14th. Um, Mr. Edwin Spate had a heart attack um, and passed away. Um, his memorial service was on Saturday. We are struggling to open our school and keep our community going without a major figure in our community. Um, so if we could just have a if you could all just keep him in your prayers and his family, he has a teenage son and a wife um, that he left behind. He's only 40 years old um, and we are grieving as a community. Um, so we appreciate all of your thoughts and prayers going forward. So um, yay, Halloween, sad reopening our school without our maintenance leader. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And then more, Evan? There are no more hands raised in the chat or anywhere else. And we normally do concerns during the meeting. That's the reason why we don't have concern in the, in the end. Evan, <laughs> good night. You have to do it. <laughs> I'll move to adjourn. <laughs> good night. <laughs> Everybody be safe. Second. It's good to have a good job. Yes, we're <laughs> yeah. in favor. Aye. Good night, folks. Uh, Right. Good night. Good night.